welcome to Collaborative Collision Technology and Society. My name is Mike Mitchell, Program Manager for Strategic Initiatives and Proposal Development in the Office of Research Development, and I will be your host for this afternoon. Uh, today is our 13th Collaborative Collision since 2016, and I am excited to see nearly 40 Florida State researchers joining us to discuss their interests, expertise, and resources in the technology and society topic area. Uh, I'd also like to mention this program is being recorded and will be posted to research.fsu.edu uh, slash collaborative collision after the event. Quick overview of our program this afternoon. In a moment, we'll welcome Dr. Gary Ostrander, Vice President for Research at FSU for some uh, opening remarks about the importance of uh, ports and opportunities for collaborative research at FSU. Uh, we'll then be joined by this afternoon's keynote speaker, Dr. John Parker, Program Director with the National Science Foundation's Division of Social and Economic Sciences uh, for a presentation on NSF interdisciplinarity and collaboration. Uh, I'll then moderate a brief Q&A session in which we invite you all to submit questions via the Zoom chat. After this, uh, we'll then go over the event format and we'll begin your uh, research pr profile presentations. Finally, Dr. Michelle Kasmer will talk a little about the upcoming technology innovation and culture initiative at FSU. If at any point this afternoon you have technical difficulties or need assistance, uh, please message Beth Hodges or Rachel Golf Albritton in the chat. Uh, now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Gary Ostrander, Vice President for Research. And thank you, Mike. I really appreciate that. Uh, thank you, everybody, for the opportunity and for uh, joining us here today. Um, you know, a number of years ago, our Office of Research Development, formerly called the Office of Proposal Development, you may remember that name, they actually birthed the whole concept of a collaborative collision at Florida State University. Over the years, uh, Beth and her colleagues have continued to modify, develop, and dare I say, evolve it to its present day iteration. There have literally been hundreds of people attending faculty, attending these events. Some instances we've opened it up to bring in people from the surrounding community that have led to some really neat collaborations. About seven months ago, Mike Mitchell and his team decided they needed to reconstitute these into a Zoom format. And I have to admit, I was a bit nervous and perhaps a little bit skeptical but it's turned out to be a tremendous success. Uh, the first one they did in this format or the only one we've done so far was on COVID. And the COVID led to, as all of the other ones have before it, new collaborations, both inside and outside of FSU. They led to, led to new research being done at our university. New proposals left the university. In fact, some on COVID that went out earlier this year have already been funded. Um, new publications describing all of this new knowledge, new information have uh, already hit the streets relative to COVID. So it's a, it's a success. And uh, I thank Mike and his team for doing that. It's a real credit to be able to do this. And that's why I'm, I'm so excited about today. Um, you know, Mike said I was going to talk a little bit or make a comment relative to why this is important to us. And for the benefit of our speaker that I'm going to introduce, Long time ago, um, in the mid 1990s, I was having lunch with Rita Caldwell. For those of you who don't know Rita, she went on um, in a little bit later in the 90s to become the director of the National Science Foundation. And Rita told me at the time, she said, the future for us in science revolves around education and collaboration. She says, we really need to do a lot more in terms of uh, interdisciplinary work across all of our disciplines. And that's certainly something that she brought with her to the NSF during her tenure. Subsequent directors of the NSF have kept that alive. And as we're gonna see with, as I introduce our speaker, he is certainly uh, of that same mindset. And that's what we really need to keep doing here at research. It's even part of our uh, strategic plan. If uh, I think most of you know that, or that it's, it's, it's highlighted in there. Now, excuse me, today's topic on uh, technology and society really needs no further comment from me. I think it's pretty obvious why this is important and why this touches on all of our disciplines, not only everybody here in the, in the virtual room today, <clears throat> but across our campus. So to this end, we're very privileged to have our speaker, Dr. John Parker, who hails from the National Science Foundation, spend some time with us today. As I highlight his background for you, it will be immediately clear why he was selected and why he really is so appropriate and is really the perfect choice for this collaborative collision format and specifically for the topic we're covering today. 
Dr. Parker is a program director with the National Science Foundation's Division of Social and Economic Sciences. His responsibilities include two big programs. I know he does other things as well. One is the science and technology studies. And the second one is the most intriguing to me, and that's the one that came out of uh, NSF's 10 big bets or big ideas that came out in 2016. And he oversees the one entitled Understanding the Rules of Life, Building a Synthetic Cell. So uh, if you haven't ever had a chance to take a look at that, you should. It's, it's pretty interesting and it's gonna have a real impact on society and technology uh, going forward. His scholarship, his expertise is in sociology, science and technology studies. His research has is, is, uh, been, been broad uh, in some senses in his field, though uh, there's some discrete areas that are worth commenting on. He focuses on the social dimensions of scientific collaboration, obviously perfect for today, scientific work life, scientific and intellectual social movements, scientific elites, scientific careers, and ties into that emotions and creativity. Couldn't really think of a better speaker for today. And I hope you will join me in welcoming him uh, to FSU. And I will apologize to everybody. I'm about to go join President Thrasher for his final state of the uh, university address. He promised me he won't talk more than 25 minutes. So I will be coming back in a little while. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Parker. And Dr. Parker, thank you for taking the time to be with Thanks, us. Thanks, Gary. Thank you. Hi, everybody. It's nice to EC everybody today. Um, COVID does a lot of things, but one thing that it does well is make it easier for NSF to do outreach, which is nice. We don't have to travel. We can see all of your lovely shining faces um, right here in the, in the multiverse. I'm excited about this talk today because developing new creative, um, innovative, particularly interdisciplinary work um, in science and technology, as well as other fields, is absolutely critical for many of the major basic scientific breakthroughs that are coming down the pipeline. And it's essential for all of the solutions to many of the, the problems that we're facing right now, socio-environmental, economic, um, structural, infrastructural problems that we're dealing with right now. Um, we're facing a lot of issues as a species. I would say it's an all hands on deck kind of moment. And the kind of work, the kinds of collaborations that this is meant to catalyze are the kinds of things that may help us deal with those kinds of issues and solve those kinds of problems in the future. But more than the practical implications, I would say that collaboration is fun. It's a lot of fun. Um, it's interesting to work with other people. Sometimes it's difficult, sometimes it's challenging, but you get a lot out of it. And when it works well, it's fantastic. Um, it's something that can benefit your career and ultimately benefit society too. With the National Science Foundation recognize that. I know that there is research that falls between the various funding programs at NSF. We also do a lot of interdisciplinary funding initiatives, uh, funding initiatives around different types of collaboration. And so what I'd like to do today is give a broad overview of the National Science Foundation, how it works, <clears throat> talk a little bit about some funding mechanisms, some funding um, programs in science technology studies and other areas of interdisciplinarity and science and technology. And then end with a few thoughts about some of the things that make collaborations, particularly integrative or diverse scientific collaborations, uh, possible and effective. Next slide. <clears throat> so I don't have to tell everyone here that it begins with the Constitution, and we have three different separate but equal branches of government that collaborate perfectly in order to make our lives good. Um, the National Science Foundation is a part of this. We're part of the executive branch, the same as NASA. <clears throat> Next slide. It's a small agency. Our budget's about 8 billion bucks. It hasn't raised much since about 2012, but almost all of it goes out the door. 95%, in fact, of NSF's money goes out the door. So it's a great investment in terms of scientific impact. Next slide. NSF is structured around eight funding directorates. We moved into a new building a couple of years ago. We were downtown in DC. We're now in Alexandria. And there's a structure of eight different directorates, the geosciences, the biosciences, size, computer information, science and engineering, engineering directorate, education and human resources. This is an interesting directorate. Oftentimes people think it's the human resources branch of NSF. In fact, it's not. 
This is a funding branch within NSF, a funding directorate that funds research into science education all the way from uh, K to uh, college um, advanced graduate, as well as thinking about how to advance the scientific workforce and research capacity of the nation. So there's a lot of good funding programs in there. Um, there's a lot of good funding in there for social scientists. Oftentimes, social scientists think that most of the money is in SPE, social behavioral and economic sciences. They have deep pockets in EHR to fund many different forms of social science. I would take a look at that if I was a social scientist or thinking about science education or science careers. Um, MPS, mathematical, physical sciences, and finally, the social sciences where I'm at. Social sciences is broken down into three different um, divisions. So within directorates, there are divisions. And within the social sciences, there is social economic sciences and um, behavioral cognitive sciences. There's also the National Center for Engineering Statistics. Next slide, please. This is how NSF works in a nutshell. <clears throat> so you see on the left-hand side of the graph of this figure, um, there's the NSF proposal generating document, affectionately referred to as the PAPPG. This is the NSF Bible. You can Google NSF PAPPG and you'll see the NSF's major guidelines that come out every year fresh. And on the bottom, you see research and education communities. That's you. Um, an idea happens when someone from the research and education community takes a look at the PAPPG and has an idea and they submit it to the proposal processing unit. That is, they send it into NSF and to our staff there. They take a look at it. They make sure that it follows all of the guidelines, that it crosses all the T's and dots all the I's. And um, if it doesn't, then it gets what no one wants, which is what we call RWR, return without review. And you've just spent six months doing this uh, thing and now it got sent back without being reviewed. Um, but most don't, most people do it right. It goes down to the program officer. I apologize, you can't see the flow diagram on this because it gets, it's black as well, but it comes to me and then I get three reviews for it. These can be within a panel, I can ask panelists to review it or they can be ad hoc. I'm sure that many people here have done ad hoc reviews for NSF. Um, if we like it, if the program officers think it's a good investment, if our reviewers say that it is good science, both in terms of its basic merits and in terms of how it's gonna help society, um, we recommend it. And it's awarded through our division of grants and agreements. Program officers never actually make awards. There are people below us in division of grants and agreements that, that do that. And if it's not, then we decline it. And in, uh, that decline goes back to you or the award goes to your organization. Awards are always made to organizations, not to individuals. Um, which is important if you decide to leave your university because it's basically up to the university whether or not you can take that money with you. It's, it's worth remembering. Next slide. NSF has two merit review criteria. Since the 19, since 1950, this is the 70th anniversary of NSF, um, we've focused on intellectual merit, basic scientific understanding. Vannevar Bush was the guy that came up with the philosophy of NSF. And in doing so, his idea was that um, you do blue sky research, basic research, and everything's gonna be okay. It'll fill um, regular societal needs. We've also incorporated broader impacts and that's crucial for NSF now. That's the potential to benefit society. This can be education, this can be policy, this can be resources for local societies, things like that. All NSF research in that sense has to be transdisciplinary. It has to contribute to basic science within a field or across fields. And it also has to involve broader impacts, that is making society better. Next slide, please. We give out a range of grants at NSF. Here are some of them. Um, doctoral dissertation research improvement grants. This differs a lot by field. Um, social sciences do more of these than natural or physical sciences. These are actually the best bang for your buck, best bang for your buck at NSF. You can give a grad student 12 grand and they'll do with 300, what I would take for 300 grand. It's, it's, it's crazy what they do. And we all know that small differences early on in careers make big differences later. It's a really important grant type and uh, we continue to support it in my program. Scholars awards, some programs give money to buy you out, to give you time to write, which is nice. Standard research grants, conference and workshop awards. These are really nice if you're trying to get a new area um, together or trying to develop a, a group of collaborators. Um, under 50K, you can pitch it to a program officer. They can review it internally. That is, if you can convince them uh, in your proposal that it's good, they can fund it themselves without ad hoc or external review. That can be good sometimes. Postdoctoral awards, career awards, five-year awards, minimum $400,000 uh, to develop your career early on. Rapid awards for research that has to be done right now. Florida, think of hurricanes. I can imagine those kinds of grants going there. 
Eager grants, these are grants for early exploratory stuff that's just crazy enough that it might work. Uh, high risk, high reward. It's hard to convince folks because you really got to get the right balance of risk and reward for an eager grant to work, but when it does, it's nice. Um, REUs, research experiences for undergraduates. I'm sure many of you have been involved in that and also research at undergraduate institutions. Next slide. This is one of the programs that, that I manage. This is science and technology studies. It's a field in and of itself. Um, people might know the work of folks like uh, Bruno Latour or um, Sharon Trawick, for instance, or some of the luminaries in this field. It studies ethics and values in science, history and philosophy of science, social studies of science, studies of science policy. Um, along with this program, you could also think about the science of science. That's another funding program. And that's more about policy econometrics as they relate to science and policy. Interesting program. Um, next slide, please. Another one I wanted to point out is ethical and responsible research. Uh, this is another program that I'm managing. And this one tries to build a solid social scientific understanding of the ways in which um, we can foster ethical STEM cultures. And the idea is that ethics isn't about a bad apple or two. Ethics is really about cultures or, that enable or disable ethics. This is why places like Michigan State have constantly roiling ethical issues because it's not about bad apples, it's about cultures. No offense to any Michigan State folks here. Um, they're working on it, trust me, they got a grant to help themselves out through this program. So thinking about this, basic scientific research into ethics. Next slide, please. For big interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary projects, the raise mechanism is interesting. Um, bold projects, up to a million bucks, five years. You have to get two different disciplinary programs in NSF to buy in. Um, they have to agree to, to review it together has to also argue why it's suitable for this kind of interdisciplinary mechanism as opposed to regular funding. And it can be internally reviewed. That is, NSF can review it, program officers can review it, and we can fund it internally without external reviews. Next slide, please. If you're doing socio-environmental research, absolutely crucial. Um, existential threats facing our species right now um, in many different forms. And a lot of that falls between biology, sociology, um, the geosciences. This program is for thinking about that, for integrated socio-environmental systems. Um, true integration of environmental and social components is required. Uh, two to five years for the research projects, up to 1.6 million bucks. And for the research coordination networks, that is a network to get folks together to create the interstitial tissue for a new discipline or specialty around the topic, um, four or five years and half a million bucks. Next slide, please. Another area, speaking of changing planet, navigating the new Arctic, um, there's no more ice up there. It's disappearing. And that has incredible ramifications, social ramifications, environmental. Think about the political, the military ramifications of no more ice on the top of the world. Um, we're looking for more social scientists to apply to this program. So far, it's been mostly biologists. Um, some cultural anthropologists thinking about Athabasca and other communities up there, but there are global implications for this stuff. Um, it's going to change the world as we know it, and it's happening now. We have a, a floating platform that's supposed to get stuck in the ice and float around up there and gather data, and there's just not enough ice for the thing to freeze. It took a long time last year for there to be enough ice, and soon there won't be. So this program thinks about these kinds of issues. Um, big grants, the collaboratory grants have really no budgetary limit. It's important stuff, and we should all be thinking about it. Next slide. I wanted to say a few things about highly creative teams. I've spent a lot of my career thinking about the groups that really made big breakthroughs in science, art, and other areas. Thank you. Um, one thing that these kind of groups do is they get away. Universities are actually terrible places for creativity. Uh, you're stuck in your office, you're stuck in the regular place with all the interruptions, with all the strictures, with all the confinements, with all the um, norms of your discipline surrounding you. Groups that get away oftentimes can develop, please go back one, um, new cultures, new ideas. On the left, you have Niels Bohr. He used to take his group in Copenhagen that developed quantum physics uh, skiing. And on the right, um, I believe that's Max Delbruck. Um, and he was the leader of the group along with Watson and Crick, the phage group that discovered um, the structure of DNA, the helical structure of DNA. They get away. Next slide. They have resources, and I guess this is part um, why I'm here, that science is ultimately people moving around in space using resources to take measurements and think about the world. Um, and resources are crucial for these kinds of groups. 
Um, think about diverse resources and skills. Also think about diverse life experiences. Um, money to meet, money to organize and work, money for graduate students. Getting access to resources for your collaborations will be a crucial step in turning the next page into the next stage of actually realizing research findings and developing perhaps a self-perpetuating research program together. Next slide. To develop a culture of reciprocity and trust, um, these are the abstract impressionists. You can think of, this is New York City, um, Rothko, you can think of Jackson Pollock, a group of creative painters that worked together, had these late night carousing sessions. The kind of trust that allows people to talk about ideas that might be crazy, might be wild, might be um, heretical relative to the existing state of science in your field. Um, the kind of reciprocity, the kind of gift giving exchange between people that makes you want to produce something that's as good as the person gave you, that's maybe even better, that helps ratchet up creativity and productivity um, together. Trust and reciprocity are oftentimes crucial in these kinds of um, diverse creative groups. Next slide. Fun. I talked about fun, and fun is really important in science. Um, Sheila Jasanoff, who I admire a lot, has a book called Science at the Bar, and it's about um, law and science. But I also think that science at the bar matters, that um, eating together, drinking together, developing a common culture matters a lot for creating the kinds of bonds and the kinds of relationships that unleash creativity. The Quantums played ping pong together. Uh, the phase group went camping. Um, a group I've been studying for the last 20 years, the Resilience Alliance, that came up with the concept of resilience, adaptation, tipping points, stable states, panarchy. Um, limericks, secret societies, meetings on strange islands, um, a lot of different ways of developing a group culture and commitment to the group and its ideas among the members. And I would say these aren't ancillary, these are actually crucial. These are really important for science and they're under theorized in thinking about science. Next slide. So beyond some of the characteristics of creative groups, a few tips for people that are getting into new collaborations with different people. Encourage diverse viewpoints and avoid false consensus. Um, what can happen in new collaborations, especially interdisciplinary collaborations, is that you'll talk for a long time and think you've come to an agreement about something and uh, someone will say something or um, you'll realize that you've been totally talking past each other the entire time. And that what you thought was consensus was not, either it was for politeness sake or because um, you really thought that you were together and understanding and it wasn't and you want to avoid false consensus and come to a point where you're actually uh, talking about the same thing and agreeing about the same kinds of, of issues. Next slide. Manage power relations. A lot of power relations happen in collaborations. This can be um, age wise. You can talk about graduate students versus professors. You can talk about men versus women and the kind of power that people try and sometimes pressure in those relationships. You can also talk about power relationships between disciplines, which I think is really important. Oftentimes, um, biologists, for instance, uh, may take up a higher or think about a higher uh, position in the scientific totem pole than social scientists or natural science or hard scientists above natural scientists. How do you get past um, those kinds of power relationships and think about epistemology and think about what science means in an open egalitarian way among the disciplines and among the actors involved? Next, provide incentives and outcomes for everybody. Um, what you don't want to create is a kind of collaboration where there's inputs from four different disciplines, but really only good outcomes for two. What is the uh, dependent variable that each different person or each different discipline or each different group within the collaboration will come out with? What do they get for their contribution and their work? One of the stories that I remember from my graduate work, I was at the long-term ecological research site in um, Wisconsin, this is in Madison, and they had postdocs looking at, social, these are social scientists, looking at homeowners' preferences for coarse woody debris in the lakes. And you know, you pity the poor, the poor social science postdoc that gets asked that question, because from a social science perspective, it's quite trivial. It's important from the ecologist's point of view, but for the social scientists, it wasn't anything that's gonna get you a paper in American Sociological Review, for instance. You need outcomes for everybody. Next slide, please. Establish clear expectations early on, authorship. Norms vary a lot by field. In some of the biosciences, um, the lead person is on the back end, and the social sciences are typically on the front. High energy physics can have 500 people on a paper, and everyone knows exactly what they did on that paper. Um, data sharing how will it be shared? Who will own it? How are you going to register the data? Who will get credit for registering the data? 
that all of these issues are important as well as intellectual property. Early on in this collaboration, as you work together, consider what your expectations are and how you will work through these various processes before you get to the paper, before you get to the important finding, before you get too embedded in the process. Next slide. That's it. Um, any additional questions? I'm John Parker at the National Science Foundation. I'm there for another month. I'm actually a rotator. Here's something also I suggest for everybody. The National Science Foundation has a catch and release policy. There are long-term program officers, permanent program officers that stay there for their entire careers. Then there are rotators. These are people like me. They go for two or three years. They add new networks, new ideas, new connections, and then they leave, oftentimes enriched. I'll be enriched. So I'll be there for another month. I'm leaving for the University of Oslo in January. But I highly suggest, if you're interested, that you think about being a rotator at the National Science Foundation. It can change your career in ways that few things can. And I'm happy to answer a few questions if anybody has any. Sure. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Parker. Really appreciate you uh, taking the time to be with us this afternoon. Folks, if you have questions, please put them in the chat, uh, and I will go ahead and start us off. Uh, you had mentioned in your presentation the role of fun uh, in the team formation process, and so I'm, I'm curious if you could just give us a couple of examples of uh, the most unique activities or exercises you've seen people and teams go through in the initial team formation process. What is the best way to to build that kind of fun culture? Doing things that you like together. It depends on the group and what the group's predilections are. I was observing some groups at the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis. These are working groups that get together a few times over a few years. And one group, every time they got together, they went out and drank these really vicious Peruvian margaritas. Um, another group would only work when they were provided um, with M&Ms by the, by the NC's uh, scientific staff. Um, T-shirts, mascots, mascots especially, symbols for the group. Those things are really important, but it can't be faked. Um, if you fake it, then all of a sudden it doesn't become sol solidarity, it doesn't become fun, it becomes forced. And uh, we all know that feeling from being uh, administrator, for being academics and having administrators push us to do kinds of things. You can think about trust falls, stuff like that. It has to be genuine. I think a, a related question there is when uh, when a proposal comes to you all and it's a collaborative proposal, it's a team proposal. What are some of the things that you look for to be able to tell that this is a this is a team? This really is a, a collaborative environment that is transcending just the sum of the individual contributions. I mean, part of it's in the description of the work and the description of what the PIs will be doing. Um, so functionally seeing within the proposal what they lay out, how much time is allocated in person months um, and what they're supposed to be doing as specified in the proposal. Part of it is also thinking about the right mix, right? Ensuring these groups have uh, a mix of gender, a mix of different career ages, um, as well as disciplinary expertise. So we wanna have social as well as intellectual diversity on these teams. And that typically leads to, to better teams. Uh, so for team building, uh, does NSF provide any kind of funding for that? What kind of opportunities are there to, uh, to fund these activities? Yep. That's what I was talking about in terms of the, the workshop. They're also called conference proposals. Conference is a big grant. They're, they're usually workshop proposals. So um, up to 100K, if you do it under 50, then you can get in a, in a program officer likes your idea. They can fund it without external review if you can convince the program officer that it's good for the field. Those are great ways to get together with other folks and um, meet several times over a year or two to develop an edited volume, to develop um, a new idea, a new theory, to develop uh, you know, experimental methods, anything that, that you would like. Workshops are a great idea to do that. At a larger scale, the research coordination networks where you can bring together dozens of people over four or five years to develop, uh, you know, a, a major research area, a major research infrastructure. And so for conference proposals, those are typically, you just submit them directly to a program officer. You don't necessarily have to wait for a solicitation. Is that, is that correct or is it vary? That's right. I mean, it varies by program. Some program officers like to have them within the regular call for proposals. Oftentimes, um, program officers will review them off cycle. You just send them a note and ask, and ask what it would take. Uh, uh, continuing on this, uh, this theme here, I have a, I think what's a really interesting question is that a lot of these activities that we talked about uh, as fun don't necessarily fit under the allowable expenses for a federal grant. Uh, so what are some of the ways that you've seen people support them? Um, oftentimes at their own expense, I guess. Um, you're right in that federal grants don't allow a lot of wiggle room for fun. Um, the fun is, between, is mostly between the people involved, I would say. Um, it's about 
doing it yourself. We're not going to fund you guys to go get some beers, but I would suggest that you go get some beers. Uh, do you have any suggested methods for establishing roles and expectations in a collaborative project? That you do it early on, however you do it. And a lot of research shows that there are some kinds of roles that are um, fundamental. Uh, an organizational leader, for instance, someone who really takes the task of organizing, of um, getting things together, of, of managing the group, its publication schedule, cracking the whip is absolutely important. There's a good book by a guy named Mike Farrell. He's at SUNY Buffalo called Collaborative Circles. And in that book, he outlines at least a half a dozen different roles that people play in these wonderfully creative groups um, in arts and in, uh, in, in writing that, uh, that facilitate creativity. I would point people to that. Do you recommend the uh, sharing of a white paper with NSF program officers in your area to determine if there's a possible fit prior to spending any time developing a proposal? Sure. And the best thing to do for any, any NSF program officer kind of thing is to write a one-page prospectus. Write a one-page prospectus that outlines um, the research topic, the literature you're drawing from, what you'll contribute, a research design if it's a formal um, project or, or what you're expected to come out with if it's a conference proposal or something like that. But a tight one-page prospectus um, with your first email saying, hey, I'm interested. Could you please look at this and let me know if I'm on base or off base? Saves everybody time saves you time from writing a proposal that may not be on base and saves the reviewers and the program officer time from declining something that may not be a good fit. Uh, so just changing the, the subject a little bit here, uh, the question about at what career stage would you recommend to start thinking about becoming an NSF rotator? Typically after, if you're talking about the traditional, um, the traditional uh, career path, I would say after associate. Assistant's a bit young, it's usually associate or full. You see people come in as an associate or sometimes at the end of their, anywhere from associate to full, actually, Any, anywhere in that line, you see someone in there. So a few years into associate, it's, it's prime time all the way up until the end of your career. Some people at the end of their professorship spend the last few years at NSF um, helping and support the community uh, and doing that before they retire. How do you go about uh, becoming a rotator? You contact the program officers who are the rotator or who are managing the program now and you say, hey, I'm interested. I potentially would like to be a rotator. Um, at that point, you're going to see what the schedule is. Usually there's anywhere between one and three program officers in a program. And it could be they just hired someone. It could be that they're going through a hire right now. It'll depend on the timeline for the program, too. Uh, this is an excellent next question here. Uh, collaborative environments in academia relying on respect for colleagues uh, and usual ideas often implicitly limit access for women, racial minorities, and uh, LGBTQ people. Uh, what approaches have you seen that broaden inclusivity and collaboration? Mm. There's a really nice grant that Laurel Smith Doer, who is the sociologist in charge of the Social Science Research Institute at UMass Amherst has right now. Um, and it's all about ensuring that women in particular, but also people of color have the kinds of resources of equitable resources and access to in, around several different dimensions, cash, collaborators, broader scientific networks um, within their university and more broadly. So there are initiatives that NSF has like the advanced grants that can be used to do those kinds of things locally. And I mean, and, and of course, any kind of collaboration, you wanna think about um, equality in a couple ways. Equality of resources helps. So ensuring people have the same kind of resources. Equality of interaction too. We're finding in some, some newer research where we're using computers to measure how scientists interact and then relate that to their perceptions of creativity that collaborations where there's more churning, more turnover, where there's more balanced conversations, balanced interactions tend to be perceived as more collaborative by this or more creative rather by the scientists that are involved. And Mike Farrell finds the same thing in, in his book as well that um, equality of resources, equality of, of participation matter hugely for the kinds of outcomes in these things. So I want to uh, give everyone just the last opportunity here. We have about five more minutes with Dr. Parker. If you have a question, uh, now is the time. Uh, while you all are thinking, I, I have a question. Um, you would mentioned Collaborative Circles, a, a book about, uh, you know, ways to, to improve interdisciplinary. Are there any other good resources along those lines that you would recommend people to read up on? Yeah, Josh, um, Joshua Shank has a book a few years ago called Power of Powers of Two, I believe, um, where he talks about the pair, the collaborative pair is kind of the basic unit of, of collaboration and unleashing creativity. Um, that's a good one. Um, 
Uh, yeah, I would also say that there's a, a good book called The Sociology of Philosophies, which sounds maybe a little esoteric. It's a fantastic book, huge thing, but it's about collaborative networks over the last 5,000 years um, on four or five different continents. And the author, Randall Collins, well-known sociologist, talks about the ingredients that lead to um, creativity and philosophy over time. It's another really interesting book on these issues. Uh, well, seeing no more questions, I uh, just want to go ahead and thank you again, Dr. Parker. We really appreciate you joining us this afternoon for Collaborative Collision. Um, uh, your contact information is up here in the screen, folks. If you have any questions, please feel free to email uh, Dr. Parker, myself, or uh, Jonathan Nurse, our Federal Relations Director, who is also on the call. Uh, and we will be happy to facilitate any further conversations. Good luck, everybody. Have fun collaborating. Thank you. Uh, just want to real quick go over a bit of uh, background of collaborative collision uh, before we start on to the research profile presentations. As I mentioned at the beginning of today's program, today is our 13th collaborative collision, uh, and already has been organizing and hosting these events since 2016 on topics like health, environment, disaster resiliency, and, and big data, among many others. The goal of collaborative collision is to bring together the Florida State research community around a single broadly defined topic area and uh, help our researchers expand their network of potential collaborators. It's very much a networking event. We're, we're here today to learn about each other's interests uh, and then have a, a better base with which to go out and, and form collaborations in the future. We strive to choose topics that will attract participants from as many different colleges and departments on campus as possible to both recognize that there are many issues uh, requiring broad disciplinary perspectives as well as to, to maximize the number of potential collaborations. Already also supports the development of teams that form as a result of the collaborative collision events by providing all participants with a copy of the event materials, uh, including the slides uh, Dr. Parker just finished presenting, uh, uh, including contact information for all of our uh, research profi profile presenters this afternoon. Uh, we also facilitate discussions, planning sessions, and eventually external proposal development resources and services. One of the other ways that we support the formation of new teams is through the Collaborative Collision Seed Fund. This is an internal funding competition for up to $25,000 uh, for the most promising new team or teams that form as a result of the connections made at Collaborative Collision. What we want to do is catalyze team development, give you something to rally around immediately after the event to form a team, develop a proposal, and submit it, and then hopefully provide uh, seed funding for you to do things like collect preliminary data, have team formation uh, meetings, all, all those kinds of things. The requirements for the program are at least two faculty from today's presentation, uh, both of which must be from different academic departments. There is no upwards limit on the number of participants, just must be at least two. Proposals must demonstrate new research projects and new collaborative teams. All proposed projects must be related to the collaborative collision topic uh, or apply that topic in a new area of research and must explain that connection thoroughly in the proposal. And then finally, there's a limit on the number of proposals on which an individual faculty member may be uh, PI. There is no limit on number on which you may be co-PI. Proposals for this round uh, of the collaborative collision seed fund will be due on January 29th, 2021. The request for proposals is currently uh, up on research.fsu.edu slash collaborative collision, and will also be sent out to all participants uh, after today's event. Uh, Want to briefly explain today's format. Collaborative collision, uh, like I said, is an interdisciplinary networking event. Uh, traditionally, when we are not dealing in a pandemic, we do this in person with posters at the Alumni Center. It's a great time. We all get to walk around and mingle. But uh, as Dr. Ostrander mentioned, about seven months ago, we made the switch to a Zoom format where uh, each of you will have three minutes to present the research profile slide that you submitted prior to the event. Uh, if you notice at the bottom right of this screen, there is a gold bar that is very slowly making its way towards the right side of the screen. This is an automatic timer on the slide. When you hit your three minutes, uh, the slide will advance automatically and you will be uh, cut off. Between each profile, there's a five second transition slide that displays the next presenter's name, which you'll notice is also shown at the bottom right of, uh, of this screen and of each research profile screen. 
uh, the host will send you an unmute request to each to the individual presenter when it is their turn to present. You must still unmute yourself. The host does not unmute you for you. Uh, please ensure that your Zoom ID is your first and last name so that we can find you within the uh, um, participants list to unmute you. And then finally, uh, if you have any questions or issues throughout the day, please uh, message Beth Hodges or Rachel Goff Albritton. Yeah. The order for this afternoon is, uh, is presented here. We have uh, 38 faculty presenting. We have Beth Hodges presenting on behalf of the Office of Research Development. And finally, we will close out with Dr. Michelle Kasmer, Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Faculty Development in the College of Communication and Information, who will give a, a brief closing remarks talking about an, an upcoming initiative at FSU in the technology and society space. So giving one more second for our host to find Roxanne Hughes or advancing? I've been unmuted. Oh, excellent. Well then, <laughs> take it away. Thanks, Mike. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Roxanne Hughes, and I am at the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory. Um, I also have an affiliated position in FSU's College of Education. Um, so I have kind of an interesting perspective on technology and I can't wait to hear about everybody else's. I am a qualitative researcher um, and my focus is on STEM identity as well as uh, more specifically coding identity. So one sense of belonging and future success in STEM fields. My research is focused on um, middle school all the way through early career. Um, and as part of my work at the Mag Lab, my focus is on building the STEM workforce more broadly. My interest in technology and society is identifying ways to make STEM disciplines more equitable to individuals from marginalized populations so that these fields can benefit all members of society. Um, I have done work studying the impact of programs on scientific literacy within society, particularly at the K through 16 student and teacher levels. Um, and my work also focuses on empowering young people to change the culture of STEM disciplines by empowering their voices, concerns, and passions to drive the work of STEM. So how I can help you, I am a qualitative researcher by uh, training and expertise. So my focus is, is on the how questions, um, as well as in some ways the why questions with observations and interviews, focus groups, et cetera. Um, I can offer opportunities for collaboration in um, studies with some of our programs at the middle school, high school, early college, and career level. Um, how you can help me, um, I'm looking for folks who are interested in providing advice on a current project that I am on, which is focused on um, quantum literacy. Uh, that is the National Quantum Literacy Network, which is part of the NSF Convergence uh, Project. Um, NSF Convergence, if you have not heard of it, uh, check it out on NSF's website. It's a pretty cool and innovative way that NSF is bringing together collaborative groups. Uh, the group that I am working with is um, led by Morgan State University, um, and our focus is on developing a curriculum and training um, for folks that are getting interested in or are already in the quantum workforce and how we can communicate this to K through 12 in a way that we can build that workforce um, get young folks interested in these fields and see the relevance of quantum technology in their lives. Um, so as part of this, we're in the phase one of this grant currently. So uh, we will write a proposal in May to submit in May for our phase two, which will be a five year project of really building this uh, curriculum. So um, in terms of folks who are interested in this kind of technology or are just interested in talking about this more, uh, I am happy to uh, have those conversations. Um, uh, and in terms of other recent proposals or publications that I've had, um, this recent uh, uh, grant that I'm currently on, as well as I just finished a grant, SciGirls Connect 2, which was an NSF funded grant that focused on STEM identity in girls. Um, and I've recently uh, published, uh, my most recent publication is focused on coding identity 
in girls. So there is this technology piece um, on a smaller scale, but I would like to broaden that more, um, more broadly to society. Um, and that is it for me, actually, Mike, so you can switch over. I don't know. Lara's ready. I see your video. <laughs> Thanks, Roxanne. I appreciate it. I do love this timer and I'm coming fresh off an NSFPI meeting, so I'm happy to, to connect in on this. Um, my name is Lara Perez Faulkner and I'm interdisciplinary by training. My PhD is in human development. I'm a faculty member in higher ed and have an, an affiliated posting in sociology. I work a lot with folks in engineering and other sciences across campus. Um, so I'm very interested in, in particular pathways to higher education and uh, careers, especially in STEM. So uh, gender and racial, ethnic, and increasingly class disparities as well in STEM post-secondary experiences, outcomes, and careers. have been looking increasingly at the workforce and faculty life. Um, I'm also interested in uh, some pieces that might seem initially tangential to that, such as uh, thinking about socioeconomic status, food and housing insecurity among students who are in STEM, um, connecting these pieces, and especially thinking about enhancing um, BIPOC and Latinx communities and experiences in STEM higher education, which has been a long-term interest of mine that, especially with some of my more recent qualitative work, is circling, um, I hope, back into focus in these next few years. Um, I have experience in doing this work uh, over some time. My primary frameworks are more oriented around sociology of education and pathways into adulthood and careers. I've done experimental survey and mixed method study design, including focus group and individual interviews. And I'm happy to help and support on research design for projects that might involve RCT experiments, mixed methods, integration, either on the qualitative or the quantitative side, or I've been doing a lot of thinking about project management um, and managing uh, teams. And so I appreciate the discussion we just had. Um, I'm sometimes involved as an evaluator or working with evaluators on education research partnerships, such as with STEM and other equity and opportunity expansion projects. Um, I enjoy and love data analysis and collaborative interdisciplinary writing. Um, and I'm interested in collaborating on research projects that use these kinds of techniques, um, again, and in uh, multiple potential roles. Uh, projects often have advisory board members, internal and external. I've done some international work and I'm happy to partner with folks, um, especially around thinking about different pieces of these identities. And I'm um, happy to think about different kinds of partnerships in this work, including with high schools and other outreach partners and, and programs. So thanks so much. Uh, websites here might link to other parts of my research. I'm done. Hello. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, thanks, Laura. And uh, I'm Xiaonan Zhang. I come from a computer science department. And I just graduated as a PhD student this August from Clemson University. Uh, my research interests span, span over the general areas of wireless networks, Internet of Things, and wireless securities. So for the wireless security, uh, my research tries to identify some new attacks in the emerging wireless communication and networks, such as Internet of Things. And then my research would like to find some some um, strategies to defend against these attacks, um, either the traditional wireless technologies or either the machine learning approaches. And then I will um, try to implement both the attacks and the strategies uh, in the real world. For the Internet of Things, I focus on achieving reliable, efficient, and secure wireless networks for large-scale heterogeneous IoT systems. And as you can see here, uh, this is my current research, and I have listed all my uh, several publications uh, in the research and projects field. And as you can see here, I'm a wireless guy, and 
although uh, I, ha I have the several experiences in the wireless transmission and wireless networking, although wireless transmission and networking is a traditional field, it is becoming more and more popular again these days due to the increased uh, prospectors in the internet of things. So um, in general, we can in general, we can try to achieve more and more data transmission without the interference. And also we can use wireless sensing to um, explore some new and interesting applications. So uh, for this, uh, for the collaborative projects, and I think I can provide the help in the wireless wheel and we can uh, identify some new interesting problems in your areas, uh, specifically in Internet of Things like smart city, smart homes, smart manufacturing, and then uh, I can solve the problems from my wheels. And I hope we can explore some interdisciplinary research opportunities and then we can join to have some uh, write some fun, uh, uh, submit some proposals for any funding opportunities and well uh, that is the introduction of my interest how I can help you and how you can help me and that's it thanks Hi, can you guys hear me? Uh, I'm hoping yeah. you can hear me. You're yes. good. Okay. Hear uh, so my name is Tyler McCurry. I'm in the Department of Geography. Uh, and my work sort of looks at the interface of issues of race and indigeneity, uh, technology, environmental justice, um, and kind of infrastructure politics. So uh, my older work focuses uh, or focused predominantly on pipeline conflicts and understanding indigenous relationships to these uh, large infrastructure fossil fuel projects uh, and trying to understand both in terms of the ways that indigenous people understood um, the threats related to uh, pipelines, but also looking at the ways that governance processes try to account for uh, indigenous relationships to traditional land and bring them into contemporary uh, environmental governance processes. So really looking at this kind of intersection of modern scientific environmental governance with uh, indigenous relationships to the land um, and in indigenous environmental justice networks. I have uh, expanded since uh, coming to FSU to try to look um, more at uh, the interface around uh, some different problems, particularly working uh, around uh, Atlanta and the ACF, um, looking at the intersection of race and water governance uh, issues, um, looking at the ways in which uh, the implementation of the EPA consent decrees in Atlanta is reshaping the kind of geography of racial segregation in the city. Um, and trying to think through uh, the politics of environmental gentrification that are associated with infrastructure repair. Um, and really what I wanna do um, moving forward is to continue looking at this interface between uh, race and technology and starting to think through how some technologies like uh, smart city approaches uh, may help address or reproduce in new forms uh, in racial uh, and ethnic inequalities in cities and how we deal with is issues of historic inequality in these kinds of planning uh, and technological interfaces. Uh, in terms of how I can help people, I have a long history of community-based research working with uh, minority communities, uh, really thinking about questions of technological development and social inequalities and critical uh, qualitative methods and theory. Uh, and then pretty extensive experience uh, collaborating with diverse interdisciplinary teams. Um, so working with people from different backgrounds, uh, both disciplinarily and uh, ethnically. All right. Um... 
Hi, uh, everybody. It has been really eye-opening. My name is Yan Yan Hu. I'm from the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. Uh, I'm also an affiliate faculty member uh, at the National High Magnetic Field Lab. Our expertise, our interests are in developing energy storage materials, and we also fabricate devices um, such as um, uh, rechargeable lithium batteries for electric cars and uh, fuel cells. Um, we work on, um, in collaboration on um, uh, solar cells and uh, you know, photoelectric and the thermoelectric materials. Um, we also, as I'm affiliated with the National High Magnetic Field Lab, um, our expertise also lies in the development of the nuclear magnetic resonance techniques for um, characterizing functional materials and devices non-invasively. And then we also deal with a lot of electrochemistry. So my interest in, in technology and society will be, um, you know, first we want to develop new materials for energy storage and conversion, and then you integrate these functional materials to develop, to develop high performance devices. Um, of course, and then we can, you know, for, for, to understand how the devices work and why they fail, um, we also design and implement in situ our parental characterization techniques to look into these issues. Um, and we, we are in partnership with several uh, companies to commercialize our technologies. Um, regarding the, um, in the connection between the technology and society, we are also interested in how to develop or how to design um, cost-effective um, technologies that can cater the uh, socially and economically disadvantaged communities or groups uh, in the society. So how can I help you? Um, we are uh, um, good at um, material synthesis to develop really novel materials with um, functional properties. Uh, we can help with the characterizations of different systems. Um, we do electrochemical uh, device testing and we do uh, invas uh, non-invasive in situ real-time uh, testing of different materials and devices. Um, we are looking for collaborations uh, in, in, in um, computational modeling, uh, large-scale reproducible fabrication, um, complementary characterization techniques and new exciting projects that, can, that, that we can contribute um, to. So again, to summarize that, the current uh, research projects that are going on in my group uh, include material synthesis, basically the development of uh, very new materials uh, uh, with um, interesting uh, uh, practical uh, functional properties. Um, we make uh, functional devices, including, uh, okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Zhou He. I'm currently an associate professor of uh, the School of Information. Uh, I'm also an information uh, at the intersection of biomedical informatics, data science, and information science. Uh, as an interdisciplinary researcher, my main research expertise um, include machine learning, natural language processing, ontologies, big data analytics. Um, and at FS FSU I School, I'm leading the eHealth lab. Uh, the overarching goal of our research is to improve population health and uh, advance and application data from heterogeneous sources. And recently, my lab has been working on projects uh, related to explainable artificial intelligence in medicine. We're working with medical professionals and doctors at the Tallahassee Memorial Hospital, University of Florida, Shands Hospital, and University of Miami to predict health applications with different health issues like heart diseases and organ uh, and those with um, organ transplantation uh, procedures. Uh, while, we're, while recently we're focusing uh, mostly on developing new methodologies and te technological solutions to decipher the black box nature of, of uh, deep learning models in artificial intelligence, um, I realized that there are quite a few important core uh, social technical issues that impede the wide adoption and develop deployment of AI-based clinical decision support systems in a healthcare setting. And some of these um, issues are associated with the human aspects of AI, for example, data sharing, transparency, uh, fairness, ethics, and inter inter uh, interpretability uh, are all uh, of some of these core issues. And uh, without those issues being solved, no matter how effective the AI solution is, the systems um, 
upon on, on, on this on this AI systems will not be uh, widely adopted. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, I'm an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary researcher and have been working with researchers in different fields. I have a quite a card of funding from NIH with an R21 grant and an R01 grant on AI-based interventions uh, and clinical trial generalizability assessments. So I would love to collaborate with people who are interested in social and uh, technological issues around artificial intelligence, data science, and biomedicine. So I can help with computational part of the project, grant writing, and data analytics. So um, that's uh, my uh, introduction. Thank you. Hey all, um, I am, can you hear me? Yes? Yes. All right, thank you, sorry. I couldn't see my um, myself on the screen there. I am Megan Kennedy. I um, work in uh, Victorian literature and history of science. And um, I am coming to you from the humanities, obviously, uh, but I do have a deep and longstanding uh, research interest in technology and society. Uh, in general, I study uh, the history of disciplinarity, um, especially 19th century, uh, medicine and the biological sciences. And I'm interested specifically in looking at how, um, uh, how conventions of observation and communication come about and how they're facilitated by different publication norms and by different forms of technology available at the time. Um, I, in the past, I've written a book on the um, development of the medical case history. Um, uh, primarily in the 19th century, and I'm currently looking at the culture surrounding uh, 19th century microscopy, um, especially in Britain and Europe. Um, so, you know, not just the um, elite communities of microscopy, but also um, penny microscopes sold on the street, Stanhope novelties, and um, the oxyhydrogen microscope, which was a mass visuality uh, performance device. I have a recent article on that. Um, and I look at texts from everything from working researchers' notebooks to books and articles that are in, um, you know, scientific journals, but also in um, popular uh, journals, children's books, advertisements, even music hall songs. So I really try to um, gain a kind of broad view of how the technology was working in the society. Um, how I can help you, um, I can offer a historical perspective on debates uh, uh, that may be rooted in things that happened in the 18th and 19th centuries about science, bioethics, um, humans' engagement with the environment, um, medicine. And I also have a historical perspective on the development and debates around different forms of technology, again, especially in medicine and the biosciences. Um, I have archival research experience, and I write about the interrelations of science, technology, and society. Um, so, uh, and, and also about how to translate your ideas for a non-scientific audience. Um, I am interested in working on projects that cross STEM in the humanities. I actually don't have a lot of experience with this. So it's one of the reasons I came to the uh, um, collaborative collision. I hope you can uh, help me. Hello, everybody. Um, can you all hear me OK? Yes. Yes. Cool. My name is Renee Julian. I'm the director of STEM libraries here at FSU. Um, and in my role, I lead a, a team of STEM um, librarians who uh, assist and work with and collaborate with faculty across the research life cycles to meet the evolving information needs of STEM scholars. Um, I know a lot of you all on your call and worked with uh, many of you before. It's nice to see so many familiar faces. My interest in tech and society, um, I'm interested in leveraging technology um, and exploring how we can do that to reduce barriers of access to scientific information. Um, I'm really interested in connecting and collaborating with folks who are passionate about um, all aspects of open science and open access, and also um, providing advocacy and education around the benefits of advancing open science and reducing um, barriers of access to information. Um, my research interests include um, exploring public benefits of open scientific data, particularly how public entities like public libraries, local governments utilize um, or don't utilize scientific um, research data um, and 
I've worked with Europe students to do literature reviews and conduct interviews in the past um, on that topic. And also uh, currently assessing faculty perceptions of the sustainability of scientific information, particularly um, how scholars, STEM scholars, um, view academic publishers and academic publishing models. Um, my expertise and interests are in research data management. Um, I've worked with uh, folks across campus on uh, work, uh, writing and consulting on data management plans um, for uh, grant applications and work with Mike and Beth and um, ORD over the years to, to provide training and education around those things. Um, how can I help you? Um, I, can, I can help you increase the visibility and impact around your data and scholarship um, and making things more open and findable, um, which does increase the impact of your research. Um, and I work with many other colleagues who are also gonna be presenting later on those types of things. And how can you help me? Um, I'm interested in folks who want to um, allow, who want to talk more about open science, uh, research data management, but also um, folks who want to discuss um, better ways to incentivize open science and focus more on carrots rather than sticks. Um, those are some of the, my key research interests now. And that's it. Thanks so much. And looking forward to hearing the rest of the presentations. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Xuyuan Marie Ho. I'm an associate professor at the School of Information. Um, so basically, I would say that I am a behavioral scientist for information science and information systems. And um, I specifically look at human computer interactions uh, more on the trusted side, but also uh, by contrast, I also look at uh, some of the online deception issues. So um, uh, why am I here? Um, I really care about uh, societal issues. They are related to technologies. So uh, the issues that I have been working on, uh, they include cyberbullying problems. Uh, as I uh, earlier mentioned about the deception issues online, and uh, recently we have the uh, COVID-19. So um, the WHO mentioned about the infodemic, which is uh, a lot of uh, misinformation, disinformation happening, going on. So um, I also would uh, love to study those uh, kind of issues and problems. And, and going from the false information, false fake news, um, I also studied uh, public opinions as well. So uh, my research is really focused on the looking at the interactions uh, in online community. So uh, why am I here? I like to meet with uh, colleagues um, on FSU campus, um, as well as colleagues, uh, you know, uh, invisible colleagues around and to explore the societal issues. They are mediated by technology. And um, I really hope that to uh, discuss Discover some nuances and approaches to help us to address some of the problems. So my approach and my view, um, I think it was uh, mentioned by Tyler earlier, um, it's very problem driven. Uh, I'm also looking at um, socio-technical issues. Uh, we look at the society as a socio-technical systems. And uh, very fortunately, my, my uh, perspective is also on this way. And I like to discover and create knowledge as well. So my research um, uh, is more towards uh, system driven and uh, also looking at the way to address the problems. So sometimes I would uh, write certain uh, research uh, questions that are addressing uh, the predictive analytic uh, issues. So how can I help you? And I basically can design um, behavioral experiments and how you can help me. And I would like to uh, explore research questions and problems together. And thank you very much. Hi, everybody. My name is Ariane Fascia. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Communication. Um, my area of research interest is in emerging media technology and how we use those media technologies for entertainment purposes. Um, I'm a social scientist by nature, so I do a lot of experimental work um, in the areas of technology for entertainment and more recently 
uh, using new media entertainment for social good. Um, so I'm really interested in finding ways to connect with others around the university about um, new media and technologies and, and society. So this is kind of the perfect collaborative collision for me. Um, so recently I've been doing some work in video games, a lot of stuff in video games, uh, particularly with regards to mental health stigma um, and how we can alleviate um, stigma and, and perhaps have better video game out, or better mental health outcomes through the use of video games. Um, I've also looked at things like binge watching behavior, social media, all these types of things. Um, so I'm interested in, in emerging media technologies from a number of different directions. Um, so I, how I can help you, I am kind of a statistician by, by nature. Um, so I, I have quite a lot of knowledge in different stats and different statistical techniques, um, but I'm really looking for someone to uh, sort of start working on collaborative grant opportunities. I'm still quite new to grant writing and um, collaboration outside of UCC. <laughs> so um, I am really interested in working with anybody who would like. Um, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and yeah, that's that's all I got today. Hey, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Cassie Ernst, and there my slide just popped up. Um, I work at the College of Engineering, and I work, I'm in charge of the Grand Challenges Scholars Program, which is just starting this year. And I work a lot with pre-engineering students. Um, my background specifically is in researching climate change decision-making. That's really where my research is related to science and technology and society studies. Um, I focus specifically in an area that some people talk about as the climate no-do gap. And so I'm really um, interested in evaluating what climate knowledge and information is actually used in climate change mitigation and mostly climate change adaptation decision making. Um, and also looking at sort of the resilience and justice and effectiveness implications of some of those decisions. So it really lies in between kind of where, where and how science is being pr produced and then what happens once it goes to the other side. Um, some people might call me or sometimes people refer to themselves as boundary runners when they go between science and policy a lot. I prefer the term boundary jogger because <laughs> I think I'm a little bit more um, deliberate in my uh, in what I do. Uh, so far, I focused really on urban energy, water, and public lands systems in terms of my research. Um, I've done some research in Sweden that really focuses on SCS, looking at some of the constraints that climate knowledge producers and intermediaries experience when they're trying to make um, useful information that actually gets used. And then I've also looked at um, sustainable water management transitions within the US um, through a succinct collaborative uh, program. I've been a science policy fellow for the NOAA Restore Science Program, and I'm still working with them on co-production and actionable information efforts. And so that's some things that I'm currently working on. Um, really this, sometimes it sounds like a lot of different cases, but I care about effective outputs of from science and engineering. So why I'm kind of placed in engineering. And a lot of my work tends to be focused. Um, I do some qualitative and some quantitative work. Um, I do a lot of work with stakeholders and going between stakeholders and scientists, um, which sometimes that link isn't necessary. Um, really quick, in terms of how you can help me, uh, some, of, some people are STEM collaborators ahead of time and a lot of my work that I do teaching right now could use some research. I'm starting the Grand Challenges Scholars Program and I'm starting an LLC and I work with pre-engineers. And so if you're interested in doing research on those types of things, I'd love it if you wanted to reach out. Um, I could see myself as a stakeholder or sub collaborator, so I really don't want to do research on myself, but um, that's something that I thought of it, that's not on the slide just based on some people's reviews. So thanks very much and yeah, have a good day. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Hey, my name is Hong Yuan Cao. I'm an associate professor of statistics. I came to FSU two years ago, and the Collaborative Collegiate is one of my favorite events on campus. I made a number of friends, both professionally and personally, through these events. I hope you like it. 
Um, my main research interest uh, lies in causal inference, statistical and computational methods, omics data integration, Latino data analysis, and survival analysis. Um, and my main interest technology and society, because uh, with advancement in science and technology, there are a lot of challenges with a different data structure. For example, omics data, like 10 years ago, 20 years ago, microarray was new. Nowadays, people have much better resolution uh, in this type of technology. And the data is a phenomenon now compared with um, like a couple decades ago. So these all bring new challenges to statistical analysis from methodological perspective. Um, from another technological innovation, mobile health, lots of people use um, M health, basically you have record for your daily vital size. How should you incorporate such information to do risk prediction? For example, if you are high, at higher risk for cardiovascular disease, based on the monitoring, we can come up with a risk, um, I would say classification, based on what we observe. If you are at high risk, we give you prevention intervention. So this can benefit society a lot. Um, and the, the knowledge we gave from scientific studies can be translated into public policy, medical practice, and eventually to improve the well-being of the whole society. Uh, my current research projects, I have a number of projects involve the omics data analysis. Basically, there are different, um, different data types, um, pleiotropic effect, which means that um, not only, um, I think, um, basically in the traditional GWAS data analysis, you look at a phenotype, you look at genetics component, which affect this phenotype. But nowadays you have, um, you have pleiotropic effect. So you want to look at causal mechanism. I also have the epidemiological cohort study, um, survival analysis, mediation analysis. How can I help you? I have statistical expertise. I have collaborating with physicians, epidemiologists, clinical fellows. I have advanced statistical modeling and I have experience in grad proposal publication. And what I need is access to population data set, scientific problems, interdisciplinary approach and domain knowledge and explore different interesting study designs. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy Collaborative Collision as I did. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Russell Clayton. I'm an associate professor in the School of Communication and director of the School of Communications Cognition and Emotion Lab. And I'm also a faculty affiliate of the Institute for Successful Longevity. Uh, so my research is um, in the areas of media psychology, media effects, and health promotion. Um, my background includes degrees in both psychology and, communica and communication. And so um, as director of the Cognition and Emotion Lab, um, my team of uh, students, we conduct research uh, that's mostly utilizing psychophysiology measures uh, to examine how people cognitively and emotionally interact with and respond to various forms of media and technology. And so these measures um, in, that we use include heart rate, skin conductance, facial electromyography, self-report, memory uh, measures, as well as behavioral measures such as secondary task reaction times. And so these measures allow me to examine sec, um, responses second, uh, on a second by second basis. And so the idea there is to have an overarching um, goal of identifying what types of technologies um, and media influence attention and emotion and memory. And with that information, I can then make um, recommendations to uh, practitioners on how to best design media and technology in terms of positive effects policy and health promotion. So I can help you by providing kind of this unique experimental psychophysiology research service uh, for any, uh, anyone interested in cognition and, um, and uh, emotion in terms of technology and media. Um, and in terms of what I'm looking for or, or would like to collaborate on, I'm interested in working with others in health promotion with the goal of grant collaborations, um, grant writing and submission. Um, I'm also interested with others uh, in terms of working with those who might have some expertise in time series analysis. 
And uh, finally, I'd like to add that my research is inherently, inherently collaborative and I enjoy working with others. So please don't hesitate to reach out. I'm sure my email is listed elsewhere, but for those who don't see it or don't have it, it's rclayton.fsu.edu. And that's it, thank you. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Horacio Russo. I'm an assistant professor of uh, management. I work in the management department, typically in, in strategic management. So uh, my research interest and my expertise revolves around sustainability and uh, specifically how community-based organizations from nonprofits to even community banks change and, and, and shape social and, and environmental dimensions of the communities on which they, they operate. Um, I'm also is interested in, in creativity and innovation, and that's where the focus with, with STEM and, and society might, comes from, right? So my uh, interest is uh, identifying other scholars. Um, I, I have a pretty specific interest, which is the nuclear power industry and the effects that that can have on uh, curbing climate change, right? Efficient energy production, how can that might be a kind of realistic solution to some of the problems we are facing, right? So um, if, if anybody's interested in, in, in working on the evolution and, and, and why do some, some certain places embrace nuclear technologies, why they not? So, so that's pretty much what I'm really interested in. Um, I can help you with a more kind of management perspective that includes, you know, analyzing different institutional environments, different countries, or uh, even different organizations and different teams. Um, I do some quantitative data analysis, and um, I've already developed a few data sets on, on, on the nuclear power industry and its evolution. I've seen some interesting findings. So if somebody um, wants to reach out and, and, and focus on that, I'll be, I'll be happy. I'm also interested in, in making those findings and, and data sets available for the public um, in case we see a bit, because I think it has, it, it can have potentially a lot of impact. Um, so that's that's pretty much it. I'm, I'm very interested in, in, in the evolution and impact of global uh, nuclear power. And so feel free to reach me if that's a topic that you might find interesting. I'm super happy to collaborate. I'm looking forward to and engage with people in, in other disciplines. So that's it. Thanks so much. Myself. Oh, there we go. Hi, everyone. I'm um, Meredith Thomas, and I'm an assistant professor in the marketing department. And I'm actually just down the hall from Horatio. So anyway, he's my neighbor. Um, I study consumer research and consumer behavior, and specifically, I look at how consumers uh, create community and the inter intersection of community and the marketplace. Um, my PhD is in marketing, but my background is in sociology and anthropology, so I am a qualitative researcher as well as many of you um, who have presented so far. So I use qualitative methodologies to explore these kinds of things. So I, um, sorry about the big gap on the side of my slide. I wasn't ex exactly sure what to include here, but specifically my interest in this collaborative collision and the um, concept of technology and society um, has to do with the research I'm currently working on in exploring how local business owners um, use technology to collaboratively build their identities um, during disruptive times, especially. And so when we have these health related or social or economic disruptions, how do local business owners collaborate with each other through technology and also how do they maintain contact with their consumer base, um, right? So thinking specifically in the time of COVID-19, how do they maintain um, them, their businesses? How do they um, collaborate to sustain the local community together? And also how do they reach their, their consumers? Um, so we're kind of looking at how we can study social media consumption and, and usage uh, to do this. Um, I'm also interested, I, I study um, community building through urban planning and through housing development and neighborhood development. So I'm interested in technologies related to urban planning um, and sustainability. 
So how can I help you? Um, so my background, again, is understanding community development, urban planning. Um, also, I've done work looking at uh, social service organizations at the community level or, or social service ecosystem level. Um, and I have a lot of experience with different types of qualitative methodologies. How can you help me? I'd like to just get to know some of you, get to know your research and learn about how uh, adjacent research across disciplines um, might be able, we, we might be able to um, complement each other. Also, if you have any ideas for other types of tech platforms and resources that could be explored through qualitative means, that would be great. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Camille Thomas, and I'm a librarian in the Office of Digital Research and Scholarship at uh, Strozier Library. Um, and my interest in technology and society has to do with how technology has influenced um, the way we think about access, particularly to um, published research, uh, d open data, like uh, Renee mentioned earlier, uh, and other open tools, um, and how that benefits and fosters innovation and inclusivity. Um, I've been working on a project, a research project this past year um, that looks at the perceptions of faculty researchers who identify as Black, Indigenous, and people of color, um, their perceptions of open access. I recently presented with my collaborator at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine um, on a specific roundtable about open. Um, and some of the themes from our research really um, highlighted how people, particularly BIPOC faculty, were not aware of um, discussions in their departments or resources on their campuses. Um, and so one of the ways that um, I can help you is through, I manage some of our uh, institutional funding for things like open access journal fees um, and explore a lot of the implications of open and and um, how you know that works with promotion and tenure and research impact metrics um, and that sort of thing uh, and kind of a, a new an upcoming project that I have um, is the Open Scholars Project um, trying to foster that kind of collaborative space but particularly for um, open access uh, and lower the barrier we had a, a previous kind of more formal committee. Um, but we want people from across disciplines to feel like they can learn about open and talk about open if they're already working on it. Um, this has been done at um, University of um, Wisconsin at Madison. Um, there's a similar program at um, North Carolina State University. Um, and so how you could help me is we're looking for um, researchers who would be interested in discussions about open. Also uh, the challenges, the benefits, um, the kind of actions that people take uh, in, in the bigger picture of open and showcasing a lot of the projects, especially projects that we already have going on on campus um, that are open, like a lot of people mentioned, um, science's impact on policy and things like that. Um, and so we'll also have a code of conduct for the group to ensure the kind of respect that we're looking for in these collaborative spaces. Um, and I can post a link in the chat, my time's almost up, of uh, how you can get in contact if you're interested. Hi, I'm Lori Mann, and I'm an associate professor at FSU School of Information. My research area is the impact of emerging technologies on organizations that provide information services. This is everything from social media to maker spaces. Right now, we're seeing the impact of this pandemic with organizations of all types re-envisioning information services through online teaching, telemedicine, social media, and webinars. And we're also seeing loss of jobs, food insecurity people falling behind on mortgage and rent payments and about to be evicted from their homes. Um, all of this makes more important the role of the public library as one of the last free places in our society, the bridge over the digital divide for those who have little or nothing. It's one of the vanishingly few places in our society where you can get free access to computers and internet technologies, free literacy help for adults, homework help for kids, uh, and technology help for seniors. Public libraries not only provide educational and technology literacy, such as makerspaces, STEM and STEAM learning for kids, supporting small business and job seekers, but also helping applicants for government services, 
helping the homeless um, and those who've recently been released from prisons and jails, helping with food insecurity, things like distributing seeds so people can grow their own food. Um, in the pandemic, we've seen things like people sitting outside closed libraries in their cars to use the internet and kids sitting outside uh, closed libraries with using the Wi-Fi to do their homework. But a challenge for the libraries is that even as their burdens constantly increase, they're also under threat of being cut or even zeroed out of budgets and struggling even just for bare minimum funding. So I currently serve on the FSU Faculty Senate Committee for FSU Libraries. I'm also on the Leon County Public Library Advisory Board. I just finished a two-year term and starting a second term. I had a meeting yesterday with Leon County Commissioner Kristen Dozier and I met earlier this year with Wanda Hunter, the Assistant County Administrator for Citizen Services in Leon County. Um, what I found is there's a lot of interest in FSU researchers getting involved locally in all of these areas of the public library and society's big problems technology literacy, food insecurity, STEM and STEAM education, and helping homeless, job seekers, small business people, and the elderly. I can also see potential research innovation opportunities in the experiential education side, so involving our students and creating new learning experiences here. So I'd like to collaborate on research and grant seeking in public libraries using technology for these societal impacts in Leon County and statewide and locally. And I can also offer my help connecting others uh, who are interested in these issues. Uh, so please reach out to me for collaborations or if I can be of help and thank you very much for this opportunity. Hello, um, I'm Max Edgemeyer. I'm with the College of uh, Business. The project I'm, pre I'm presenting today concerns the development of a book on elements of sustainability. I've worked on various aspects of sustainability for a long time. This book will integrate this work into a holistic system model of global sustainability. It will define sustainability space with, which continuously changes through evolution. This space combines the global environment and human society. These two interact by humans extracting benefits through imposing, bur imposing burdens on the environment. Um, through this interaction, they change the processes that are intentionally going on in society and the environment, and which in turn change the value of benefits and burdens. The objective is to control the sustainability space such that the sum of benefits over an infinite horizon is maximized subject to the benefits at any time being at least sufficient to sustain the human population. According to Wittgenstein, since humans exist inside the sustainability space, they cannot control it. Therefore, indirect methods of control are needed. These methods will assure sustainment and the harmonious evolution of all elements of the sustainability space while extracting a high level of benefit. The models I'm developing are all composed of purposeful systems as basic elements. Purposeful systems mimic living creatures and are defined by continuously evolving purposes and boundaries. They include material and non-material objects. Purposeful systems are not separable, but are connected into many dimensional constructs through shared objects. Thus, they are not bound by geometry. Similarly, they may use elements of any discipline and are therefore essentially transdisciplinary. The fact that purposeful systems combine into many dimensional constructs makes them ideal vehicles to model complex social systems. Rules for order in such systems, for instance, ethical norms or laws can be deducted directly by logical analysis. Also, models of such systems can readily be translated into object-based simulations. I'm interested in talking with researchers from any discipline who want to explore transdisciplinary work related to sustainability or any other application of purposeful systems. Thank you. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. I presume everyone is hearing me. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Ibrahim Ahmed Sheriff. I'm uh, a research faculty in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department. 
Um, so my uh, major uh, focus uh, is on uh, water resources and environment systems. Uh, I do a lot of uh, computer modeling and quantitative analysis to uh, solve a variety, variety of um, water resources projects, including uh, floods, surface water pollution, uh, dam break, urban stormwater, and um, impact of land use change on water systems. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in basically using uh, technology um, as I'm, I'm doing a lot of uh, modeling to help uh, solve um, uh, disaster, uh, reduce the impact of disasters being natural like floods or man-made like um, impact of human activities um, uh, such as um, uh, urbanization and land use change. Um, so how I can help? Um, I could uh, uh, do uh, predictive uh, modeling to simulate uh, flooding, uh, stream flow uh, analysis and uh, hydrology basically and pollution rivers. And I do a lot of uh, stochastic uh, analysis to support uh, decisions um, on the decision making under uncertainty. And uh, a lot of uh, time people um, use these models, but uh, don't know uh, the uncertainties and errors. And it's very challenging to communicate these research, these um, um, limitations and errors of the models with the public and stakeholders, because it might be taken as lack of credibility. And a great example related to my research is under the flood, uh, flood zones that people use to purchase their houses and uh, take that as a definitive um, uh, answer to the flood risk, which is not. So how you can help me? I, I, would, I, I would love to collaborate on um, com effective methods for communication of complex analysis with the public and stakeholders, also data collection. And as you know, water resources uh, interact with a lot of disciplines. So I would be happy to collaborate with uh, any uh, research that is related or could interact with water resources, flooding and a stream flow pollution. Thanks for uh, this opportunity. It was, uh, I guess, great to hear uh, about uh, your research. Hello, everybody. My name is Patrick Merrill. I'm a professor at the School of Communication, associate professor to be precise. What interests me uh, these days particularly is the aspect of crisis communication. And um, I think we've seen that, especially over the last few years, regardless of your political preferences, that's just the uh, nature of the game i think there's a beast that was created called 24 7 media and multiple platforms especially on social media and i think a lot of the people uh, actors and news content producers have now privileged speed rather than quality and that led to crisis communication and the boom of that area really so i think if you think of for instance even um, this idea of the dissemination of a vaccine and you look at the latest data that was available from the Pew Research Center and other public opinion institute and data available across the, country, across the country and the globe, a lot of the people have this balance between trust and information that is given to them, trust in the source of the information and then their behavior and their attitude. And I think uh, for me, what interests me is really moving forward with that. Uh, uh, and, and I think as we more and more rely on technology and its implication on society, our behavior or attitudes in multiple topics, whether it's urban planning, climate change, voting behavior, civic behavior as a whole, there is very much this crisis communication component or risk communication, depending on the field, if it's closer to health or climate change, for instance. So all of those issues interest me. They interest me because uh, I used to be a, for, a foreign correspondent, a journalist internationally. And I think moving from being a journalist now to an academics, I see really the gaps that need to be filled. 
across many of the Western democracies, we are the lowest level of trust uh, for news and content, which to me uh, is highly problematic. And so I think um, this is something that we need to understand a bit better. So I can help you with international components. I can help you with any type of crisis and risk communication facets of your project. Or if you wish to have a French angle to your studies. Thank you very much. Hello, uh, my name is Aimee Boutin. I'm in the Department of Modern Languages and Linguistics. Uh, my area is French studies, but uh, for the last 10 years, I've been very involved in interdisciplinary perspectives, specifically sound studies and urban studies, as well as gender. So there are three areas or four areas um, where my interests intersect with technology and society. The first is that I've been studying technologies of mobility, particularly the railway, from historical cultural perspectives. So I could bring um, my knowledge of this area to any collaborations. I've also been interested in the intersections between uh, among gender mobility and technology. So do all people move the same ways for the same purposes with the same outcomes. Uh, I have a long standing interest in sound. And of course, a lot of technology is noisy. So how do noise levels impact different um, interactions with technology, social behaviors, as well as health, cognition and creativity. And uh, another more narrow interest, but one that, that has been quite fascinating. Uh, I've been interested in, in the human voice, especially women's voices as they are imagined and reproduced in society. So technology synthesize voices in very particular ways, often using the female voice uh, in ways that connect with um, other historical practices. Um, all right, so how I can help you I can bring uh, humanistic or historical perspectives to our collaboration and as well as my expertise in sensory studies or my interdisciplinary background, as well as my international perspective and knowledge of the French language. I have good uh, writing and organization skills, so I'd be happy to uh, assist with editing or proposal development. And how you can help me I have enjoyed collaborating with colleagues um, from the humanities. I've been involved in several collaborations, but not so much with colleagues in STEM. So this is something that I would welcome, an opportunity to collaborate with colleagues in STEM or the social sciences. And that's about it. Thank you. Hello everyone, um, this is uh, Guangji Sheng and uh, I'm from the business school. I'm from the Department of Business Analytics, Information Systems and uh, Supply Chain. Uh, so the thing I wanna share today uh, is about a uh, project I thought that would be interesting uh, and that will fit under this general umbrella. Um, about myself, uh, I'm Associate Professor and uh, I've seen my several of my colleagues and office mates, um, kind of folks that work uh, in the same floor as I am. Um, it's good, very good to see them. Uh, the project I'm thinking about that will be quite interesting is that uh, we have all these crowdfunding platforms, uh, for example, Kickstarter. And um, these platforms, they have um, small, um, kind of to medium-sized studios or individuals uh, working on innovative projects. And at the same time, at the end of last year and throughout this year, and we have um, COVID. So if you think about what uh, is the impact of this uh, uh, pandemic on uh, the innovative world in terms of these crowdfunding platforms, 
So we might see that uh, the productivity of these workers that's on the supply side, uh, they might go down. Uh, some of these projects, if they are primarily working from home, they might not get as affected as much as these other uh, projects that would require raw materials. But in general, we should see uh, some productivity drop, but that could be heterogeneous. Uh, on the other hand, if we think about what uh, the backers that are uh, the general public who will be interested in these projects that innovators are developing and uh, donating some monies, and some of them will take a kind of a token souvenir and a token product. And these people, they have an income drop. Um, with income drop, they might be less willing to donate to support, but at the same time, because this is a pandemic, so people in general might feel more philanthropic. So the benevolence part of this effect might encourage them to support these small size innovators more than during the normal times. So on the demand side, it's really not clear whether the pandemic has a positive or negative impact on people's support for these small size innovators. Um, so this is kind of the thing I want to study. Um, if you're interested, just contact me. I do theory, I do empirics, and uh, you just tell me what you do. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for um for uh, having me. My name is Andy Opel. I am a professor in the School of Communication and I missed the memo on uh, formatting the, uh, the slide. But uh, my work, I'm a, I'm a documentary filmmaker and I'm interested in environmental communication. Uh, and I spent the last year uh, in Norway, working on a Fulbright project, uh, the Climate Witness Project, where I was collecting uh, observations of changes in the Arctic and subarctic region and uh, connecting those anecdotal observations to the science to try and develop effective uh, storytelling around climate because we have a real disconnect between the, the data, the science and public perception. And that, that disconnect has been enduring. It's not only in the US, it's also in Europe. And so I'm interested in trying to figure out effective ways of visual communication uh, technologies to, to communicate climate science and other environmental issues. Uh, I'm particularly interested in uh, virtual reality as a, as a tool. And there's only a small number of people doing virtual reality production at FSU. And we're all kind of scattered around campus. So I'm interested in kind of pooling some of those resources, the intellectual material resources and uh, on, on a collaborative project around uh, immersive environmental media. Uh, and then also after collecting the uh, these stories about kind of environmental collapse and in the face of COVID, uh, I'm particularly interested now, instead of telling more stories about all, what's the negative things that are happening, I'm, I'm turning toward um, environmental, like climate solutions. So I'm working with some people here at FSU on Project Drawdown, which is a, a, pro, a set of ideas around trying to, what's, what is possible to, to get us to a, a zero, a low carbon or zero carbon economy. Uh, so I'm interested in, climate solutions, telling climate solution stories and, um, and doing that. And then evaluating those techniques and coming up with effective visual communication strategies in a variety of formats, whether it's traditional documentary film, short social media PSAs, or more emerging Im immersive media uh, in the form of virtual reality, 360 video and, and, and interactive experiences. So if any of that is interesting to you, please uh, reach out to me um, and thank you. Hey everyone. I'm Paul Marty from the School of Information. So great to see so many people here. I'm a professor of information science, and so I've long been interested in that intersection between people, information, and technology, and how society is shaped and reshaped by the technology tools that allow people access to information resources. 
my main research area looks at information systems and technologies in museums, which means that I look at the socio-technical interactions that take place in museums and other cultural institutions. Some of my recent work in that area has looked at how museum technology professionals are best suited to support their institutions in times of crisis like COVID-19. Some of you may also know that I serve as chair of the Innovation Hub Steering Committee here on campus. If you haven't seen the Innovation Hub in the Shores building yet, you should be sure to check that out post pandemic, of course. There's a lot of great resources there for students and faculty related to innovation and technology. One of the things that the Innovation Hub Steering Committee is working on uh, right now is a new program that will recognize the university's most innovative undergraduate students. And we would really love your help with that. If you have examples of undergraduate students doing innovative, creative work in your majors, please share them with us. That would be really helpful. I also co-chair the Undergraduate Information Technology Program at the School of Information. And one of the things we're working on there is an interdisciplinary undergraduate minor on technology and society, which includes courses from departments across campus that encourage undergraduate students to look at the socio-technical implications of technology across disciplines. And I'd love your help with that too. So if you know of undergraduate courses that give students the opportunity to reflect on those social, cultural, ethical implications of technology, please let me know. That would be really helpful. In general, I think that all of these efforts we've been talking about are giving us a chance to work together to reshape the way we think about life in the information age and the unintended consequences of technology on society. I know our students are really interested in these questions from the E-series course that I've been teaching for the past five years called Is Google Making Us Stupid? And I'm convinced that we need to prepare our students and ourselves to be innovative, creative, and engaged lifelong learners in the digital world. So I'm really hoping that our collaborations here will help us promote a culture of innovation and uh, digital culture on campus. And I see I have just a few seconds left, so I think I'll mention that you can make a progress bar timer in PowerPoint pretty easily by adding a rectangle bar graphic to your slide, then using a left to right wipe animation to make that bar disappear over a set period of time. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Aline Kalbian. I'm um, the a professor in the Department of Religion and chair of the Department of Religion. I've been at FSU for over 20 years. And my particular area in the study of religion is religious ethics, which is a scholarly subdiscipline within the academic study of religion that looks at the ways that um, religious communities and religious actors think about moral problems how religious authorities enforce morality, how they conceptualize morality, and how uh, ideas about morality and ethics change over time as religious communities encounter new technologies and new developments in society. Um, more specifically, my research has focused on ethical views about medicine, health, sexuality, and gender. Um, the bulk of my published work has been on reproductive technology and technologies of birth control in the context of Catholicism in the United States. So I come at this work as a historian, but also as a scholar of texts. I'm really, as a philosopher who's interested in the way that people make moral arguments. My work is also informed by feminism and by gender studies and pretty much informs what I do across the board. Um, as far as my interest in technology and society, when this call came out, I was in the middle of working on a paper on religious views about CRISPR technology and gene editing. So the call seemed very apt and appropriate to me at the moment. Um, and I've, I'm interested in expanding my collaborations across units at FSU. I've worked in the past with faculty in the law school and in the medical school, and I'm my interest is just to keep that going and to expand it even further. As far as how I can help you, I have expertise in ethics. I've taught um, for many years courses in religion and bioethics and religious ethics and moral problems. Um, my courses are comparative in nature. So even though my own research focuses more on Christianity, my um, knowledge base includes many religious traditions and communities in different historical periods. Um, I've also been, for the past 10 years, the co-editor of the Journal of Religious Ethics, and so I have a lot of experience with uh, publication and publishing. I would be happy to help people out in that area. 
as far as how people can help me, just expanding my research and thinking about technology. I've just been taking so many notes as I've listened to everyone's presentations and thinking about all the ways that our interests overlap. And, and I have a longstanding interest in how to sort of integrate science and humanities together through the study of ethics and sort of overcome this perception that a lot of people have of a kind of divide between humanities and STEM, which I don't think really needs to exist. Carrie, are you uh, with us this afternoon? Nope. Uh, well, we will go ahead and skip Carrie uh, and move on to Jeff Whalen. Hey, everybody. Uh, hopefully, you guys can hear me okay. Um, happy to be here. Uh, I just want to say it's been really awesome and super interesting to hear all the presentations so far. Um, really happy to be a part of this. Um, so I've been at FSU for quite a while, uh, made a big transition a couple of years ago. Um, I started uh, at the Mag Lab actually working there uh, for about 10 years. Um, most of my research at the time focused on materials synthesis and characterization. Uh, early on, this was in um, hydrogen fuel cell storage systems, uh, mostly intermetallic systems. Later, this kind of transitioned into work for Department of Defense on uh, uh, magnetically enabled systems. Um, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I really loved the Mag Lab. Got, got to do a lot of work with Roxanne Hughes, who presented earlier. Um, but uh, made the switch uh, to the Jim Moran College of Entrepreneurship in 2019. I am their STEM entrepreneur in residence. And um, it's really been a lot of fun to make this transition. Um, I have uh, several publications, about 30 from my work in the materials research, but um, that really kind of shifted uh, later in the work that I was doing to more of a focus on intellectual property and patents. Um, I have several patents that I've done with FSU. And then that took me into this world of STEM entrepreneurship. And really my interests are in that intersection between science, technology, engineering, and mathematics with entrepreneurship. And this is really something that, you know, I believe in today's society and the world we live in, it's hard to find venture creation that doesn't in some way rely upon STEM technologies. So um, it's maybe a broad term, but uh, STEM entrepreneurship is, is the field that I've been working in uh, for the last couple of years specifically. Um, really a lot of what I'm working on is trying to uh, grow and expand uh, this STEM acceptance, the influence, the appreciation in society. I think that a lot of um, the up and coming generation and even our current generations uh, kind of view entrepreneurship as, as you know, purely business over here, purely venture creation. And uh, especially on the entrepreneurship side, having moved over there, uh, there's this opposite view of STEM as this dark hole of uncertainty and, and something weird and, and impossible to uh, actually learn. Hi, everyone. I'm Danny Fay. Um, I'm an associate professor in the ASCII School of Public Administration and Policy. Um, I'm a public management and public policy researcher, but I really uh, cut my research teeth on uh, academic research collaboration. Um, and this interest is primarily individual level collaboration at universities and how um, university researchers partner with industry and government to pursue uh, projects and the tension between knowledge production 
and uh, property focused outputs uh, and how those can determine the, the impacts of research collaboration. Um, I also have a particular research interest in uh, research malpractice. So um, when these research collaborations uh, go wrong and uh, the individual determinants of those uh, malpractice events uh, in terms of power and marginalized status um, of particular groups. Uh, I've also worked with um, a, a team uh, that was funded by NSF and Google that looked at how uh, military service members can use STEM education and entrepreneurship to um, transition back to civ civilian life uh, after their service. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping to extend those research ideas, um, looking at the organization and policy, the determinants of collaboration um, and STEM production. Uh, I am focused primarily on quantitative uh, analysis. So uh, those qualitative folks that uh, uh, talked earlier, I'd um, be happy to talk with you. Um, hopefully get some synergy going on. Um, also, I have a lot of uh, expertise in data management, um, survey development, uh, proposal development. Um, I have done work in all levels of government, uh, federal government, state government, local government, um, and higher education. Um, my most recent work is focused on intersectionality and representation in universities and how that can translate to undergraduate success. And I'm hoping to extend that to uh, graduate um, success and uh, collaboration at the graduate level. So thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Zena Ward. I'm uh, a, a new assistant professor in the Department of Philosophy here. Um, my, so I'm primarily a philosopher of science, um, but my PhD is in history and philosophy of science. So I have um, some, his, some historical and, and sociological background as well. Um, and within philosophy of science, I particularly specialize in philosophy of cognitive science. So um, uh, I do some philosophy of neuroscience and philosophy of psychology. Um, in terms of where my interests intersect with the with the topic of today, um, I'm, as I say, broadly interested in how social currents shape scientific research. Um, in my work thus far, that's been uh, largely channeled into um, interest in science, in the role of values in science. So, what role do non-epistemic values play? How do we how do we distinguish between legitimate and illegitimate value influence in science? Have been some of the the questions I've been most interested in. Um, I also am sort of developing a new uh, new research area in data ethics. Um, I, I'll be teaching. I've recently taught an ethics of technology class, and I'll be teaching uh, the data ethics class in the new um, master's in data science um, when it, as as it gets off the ground. So um, I'm hoping to to develop research um, projects there uh, as I as I deepen that part of my teaching. Um, I'm especially interested in things in to topics related to explainability and fairness um, and also privacy. Um, and finally, um, I, uh, I also have both teaching and research interest in science and policy. So how do we structure the interface between science and policy? Um, how do we um, bring relevant science to bear on policy questions? Um, in, terms of on, in terms of ongoing projects, um, as I say, I've uh, maybe done the most work on values in science, which is a, you know, its own area of philosophy of science now. Um, so uh, one of my recent papers listed on the slide there um, uh, tries to distinguish different things we mean when we say that science is value laden. Um, and I'm also, I've also done some work on the role of values in climate science and the, the work of the IPCC in particular. Um, at the moment, I'm also planning, or I'm also currently working on a project um, in sort of the integrated history and philosophy of neuroscience. Um, I'm interested in um, a mid 20th century debate about whether uh, motor cortex represents muscles or movements and what that can tell us about uh, philosophical th debates about representation. Um, and then um, I'll be maybe less apropos of the of science and of society and technology, but um, this I'm going to be starting soon a project on clustering and natural kinds, uh, exploring why we why we tend to think that clusters um, are are or clustering is a is a feature of, of genuine scientific and social kinds. Um, 
In terms of potential collaborations, um, you know, I'm a philosopher, so ethics, conceptual clarification, all of that really interests me. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Laura Lynn, and I'm the Academics and Partnerships Coordinator for FSU's Sustainable Campus. It's been really great to hear so many of you uh, mention the environment and sustainability in today's presentations. Uh, Sustainable Campus is the official office of sustainability here at FSU, and we believe that sustainability means meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Um, we also view it as the intersection between the environment, society, and the economy. So our office is really interested in exploring the connections between the campus and community related to sustainable technology implementation. Uh, we're really open to helping to facilitate partnerships uh, that are related to topics like green businesses and uh, data ethics. And we'd also like to provide support for research, outreach, and applied projects uh, that are related to social impact of sustainability innovations. Uh, for example, renewable energy, electric vehicles, plant-based meats, smart cities, things like that. So in my role at Sustainable Campus, uh, I connect with community organizations to explore ways that faculty and students can help solve real world sustainability challenges. Uh, this links back to the broader impact requirements in many grant proposals. So I can help facilitate this type of collaboration by providing small grant funding for sustainability related projects, uh, providing connections to local sustainability related nonprofit and government organizations, and also providing links to the FSU facilities department if you're interested in doing research on campus. Um, I can also highlight your sustainability research and projects in our sustainability faculty newsletter, which can draw attention to your work and, and help foster these um, interdisciplinary collaborations. So you can help our office by sharing more details about your work uh, for our institutional reporting uh, that's related to sustainability. Uh, you can also join our network of sustainability faculty and researchers and also allow us, allow us to help you through our programs. Specifically, Sustainable Campus offers uh, limited resources through our Green Fund, which provides small grants for sustainability projects. Um, and I also coordinate the Campus as Living Labs program, which pairs FSU faculty and entire classes of students with uh, community partners for applied sustainability research projects. So thank you all so much for your time, and I really look forward to seeing the other presentations. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Cynthia Young. Uh, I'm assistant professor in the Department of Economics. I specialize in econometrics, uh, which concerns the development and application of statistical methods to analyze economic phenomena. Uh, I work in both applied and theoretical econometrics. Uh, currently, my areas of research interests include panel data analysis with a focus on cross-sectional dependence namely how to model, estimate, and test the interconnections between individuals, firms, counties, and so on. Um, I have expertise in spatial econometrics, vector models, and networks. Uh, I'm also interested in urban and regional economics. Uh, in terms of research on technology and society, at the moment, I don't have a ready-to-go project, but uh, I've always been interested in the economic and social impact of technology development. So um, broadly speaking, I'm interested in the productivity gain or loss from remote work and collaboration. Uh, I'm interested in the economic impact of new supply chain technology. Uh, I have worked on projects earlier that looked at the input output linkages and its impact on economic fluctuations. So this would be something that I would like to further investigate and thought about technology and COVID-19. Uh, so recently I developed a stochastic network model with a co-author to analyze the pandemic. So currently I'm considering uh, possible extensions that could incorporate uh, technologies in the public health response, such as testing and contact tracing. Uh, last but not least, technology diffusion is another topic that I'd like to investigate. Uh, so I've been working on new models and estimation techniques that study the spatial spillover effects. So I think technology diffusion could be one of the very interesting applications. Uh, well, in terms of how I can help you um, as an econometrician, I can help with econometric and statistical analysis. 
Uh, I'm especially familiar with large heterogeneous penodata models and spatial temporal models. Uh, I also teach time series analysis, which could be useful to disciplines outside economics. Uh, and that can also potentially contribute to the estimation and inference in a program evaluation. Overall, I'm just very excited to learn from everyone today. Uh, it's the first time that I participate in this event. I'm very thrilled to get inspiration and new perspectives from colleges, uh, from colleagues who are not in the same discipline. Uh, I'm seeking potential collaborators who share common interests and have access to interesting data sets. That's all. Thank you so much for your time. Hello. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Trey Buscaran. Here, let me show my video on there. Hi, uh, I'm happy to be here. I have, uh, <clears throat> I'm an assistant professor of critical art practices in the Department of Art, and uh, I co-founded and co-direct the uh, Expanded Cinema Lab. Um, <clears throat> so my uh, expertise or interests include uh, practice-based art research, um, installation art, video art, media ontology, and aesthetics. Uh, I'm also certainly interested in um, machine vision and uh, surveillance. Um, <clears throat> my interest in technology and society stems from the fact that I, I am a post-disciplinary installation artist focused on American spectacle. <clears throat> um, site responsibly, my process begins with salvaging local materials that resonate indexically with waste culture and the surveillance state. Aggregating these waste materials into networks of sculpture, I weave surveillance equipment into the sculpture such that it looks out at people as they approach the work. The video feeds are combined algorithmically and redeployed through a multi-channel projector or array, submerging the installation in a distorted vision of surveillance of the people in the exhibition space. By projection mapping, live video mashups of the exhibition viewers back onto the waste-based physical structure the work sees, serves to implicate spectators back into what they've arrived to judge. Um, so I'm, I'm looking to connect with other FSU professors from other disciplines to explore creative uh, collaborative possibilities. Um, how you can help me, I'd love to get to know you and to have you come by the, the center, of, uh, the expanded cinema lab. Um, we have a, about 5,000 square feet that's been gifted to us by uh, TCC Center for Innovation. And um, we have connections that ex existing already to the departments of music, communications, film, uh, uh, theater, and um, uh, uh, library sciences, uh, among others. So we're, we're continuing to grow. We're also connected to the Innovation Hub and Ken Baldoff there. So we're interested in getting to know you and what you might be interested in, in terms of uh, putting yourself forward towards um, having a more, um, well, let's say an, an art facing wing of your practice. If you're interested in exploring that and exploring um, the moving image and all of its various manifestations, including virtual reality, augmented reality, um, et, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> screen culture is where we all are nowadays. So uh, let me know. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing um, all the rest of these presentations. Thank you. I can... All right, I think I'm unmuted now. Um, so my name is Jonathan Stewart. I'm a new assistant professor here in the Department of Statistics. Uh, my primary research interests lie in statistical network analysis, uh, but my research interests broadly include modeling dependent data uh, that have complex structures. My applications that I've studied have ranged from medical to biological, but my uh, primary interests lie in uh, sociology and economics, specifically social network analysis. So that kind of leads me to why I'm interested in technology and society. And that's because technology has fundamentally changed how our society uh, kind of interacts with each other. And so we can think of people in collaboration networks and how do we collaborate? I've written papers with people um, on different continents and never met them face to face until a conference in which we presented the work. 
So technology has changed how we collaborate, how we communicate, and how we engage in financial transactions and more. How uh, networks of criminal or uh, criminals and you know terrorists or cyber terrorists uh, coordinate. And so um, within the context of social network analysis, I'm interested in developing new statistical methodology and theory, which allows us to kind of better understand how technology and these new um, kind of structures uh, such as social media, the internet, how these have changed, how we uh, interact with each other and we relate to one another. So, but my research has, uh, is concerned with foundational theory and mathematical statistics, but I also am very interested in applied work, specifically in social network analysis. So I've, I've uh, listed some of my research highlights here, um, including kind of theoretical uh, guarantees for estimators uh, for models, as well as methodological developments for multi-level social networks. And I also highlight here my software development. So one of the things that my collaborators have enjoyed is my ability to create new mathematical models that can be customized to new situations. And so uh, to do this, we have to have flexibility in how we construct the models, which leads me to how I can help you. Uh, my expertise in modeling data with complex structures, emphasizing uh, customability, um, as well as developing custom statistical software and libraries, which I have publicly uh, released. So I think I have over 50,000 downloads in the uh, statistical softwares that I've um, released publicly. So how you can help me, I'm, as again, I'm a new assistant professor, so I'm really interested in learning what people are working on. And, data, I'm always interested in getting to analyze new data. So uh, if you have anything that you'd like to uh, share with me, I'd be very interested. So it's great to hear you all today. Thanks. Good evening, everybody. My name is Rob Schoen. I am an associate professor in the School of Teacher Education in the College of Education, um, and I'm also uh, associated with the Learning Systems Institute. Um, my work, my search is for um, educational interventions that can help to improve mathematics teaching and learning. Um, specifically, what's listed on the right hand side of the slide are a series of four projects um, that I've had. Two of them are active. Uh, related to a teacher professional development program called Cognitively Guided Instruction. Um, it's focused primarily on elementary level mathematics um, and helping teachers to understand uh, or perhaps remember how young children um, think about mathematical ideas, um, which is which very often is, is uh, completely different from how an adult um, or a math expert thinks about those same ideas. Um, uh, but, but what I would like to uh, share and what I'm looking for partners to, to collaborate on are, are two things. Um, they're quite different, um, but on the slide they're listed here. One is we, we have developed and field tested uh, mathematics tests every year for elementary age students. Um, we, uh, printed and distributed 100,000 test booklets this fall um, to, to school districts across the state. Um, and I've always done it paper pencil because uh, that I thought was sort of the primary way that people do mathematics. I think now, um, partly because of the pandemic, that is no longer true. So we need to convert. I'm ready to convert all my paper pencil tests to a computer computer-based platform um, and am, am way too busy to, to do that self and would be delighted to find a partner who has that interest and expertise, um, uh, if not within FSU, uh, perhaps a private company who wants to, to partner on that. Um, but the thing I'm most excited about um, is I wanna gather stories of the thousands of teachers who participated in CGI. They tell really, really powerful, compelling stories of how CGI has changed their views of themselves as mathematicians, uh, reduced their anxiety about teaching math, um, 
So I want to collect and curate these stories. It could be uh, something like StoryCorps does. It could be documentary. It could be some other way. But if that's what you do, I'd love to talk with you. Hi, I'm Crystal Taylor. I'm Director of Public Policy and Data Analytics Program at the DeVoe Moore Center. And uh, the DeVoe Moore Center um, is housed within uh, Bellamy. Um, and so we're our in-house unit of the College of Social Science and Public Policy. And uh, basically we look at uh, market-driven research, um, very kind of applied economics, public policy, and and we focus primarily on Florida, uh, but we do look at some other areas uh, as well. But Florida is kind of our main uh, center. Um, my background is in urban and regional planning, um, and I also teach applied economics, so economics research methods and things like that. Um, one of our big projects that we're working on is called, uh, and you guys can go Google now if you want, uh, Florida OpenGov. And so that is our current transparency website. And so what we're doing there is we're uh, acquiring uh, different types of payroll data, um, city, county, um, special districts, uh, revenue and spending data. Uh, uh, we have great uh, K through 12 data and we're putting that up on that uh, website. Um, I have a team of interns who are interested in kind of getting real world experience, learning how to acqu uh, acquire data and uh, learn how to clean it, noting that, you know, when you get this new data uh, from agencies, it's not all clean and perfected. So we're getting experience for our interns. Um, and then we've transitioned some of our, uh, our, our click view into Tableau charts. So uh, uh, we've had some great training from uh, students over in the business world who uh, have great, had great lessons in Tableau. Um, so we'd love to recruit from there. I'm also actively recruiting an intern uh, uh, who has a HTML and CSS and JavaScript um, experience because we're gonna actually open up another website so we can do some uh, AV testing um, of a citizen version of that. Um, and I'm also, we're still always acquiring new data. So um, like I said, our K through 12 is probably the most updated and most granular. And we have that data, let's see. I'd say the last six years um, is the most detailed. And then we have some data previous to that, but it's not as granular. And so we're filling in some of those holes. Um, also, so if you look on uh, the right-hand side here, you'll see the Tableau visualization that's on our website. Um, and then I'm also, we're starting to build a property value geo database. Um, and so right now it's just for Leon County, but I'm hoping to pilot that out a little further. Um, and so what I'm looking for you guys from is you help me recruit interns, um, maybe looking for a research professor who wants to use some of that data and who'd like to collaborate on some papers um, and help us with the training opportunities for our interns. So if you have any GIS interns, we'd love to have you send them this way or in stats. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, my name is Caroline Stratton and I'm a new assistant professor in the School of Information. So my research about tech is, is uh, all about technology and society. I'm particularly interested in relationships um, between access to computers and the internet uh, along with inequality and international development. So my most recent work has been about digital inequality and organizations approaches to addressing digital inequality. Um, my work as a PhD student was about information and communications technologies for development in Latin America. And I'm also interested in uh, telecommunications policy in the US and particularly in policy diffusion uh, across municipalities and states. I myself um, am a former recovered nuclear engineer and I consider myself a social scientist and I'm broadly interested in um, how organizations intervene with technology intending to create social good. And so within this, I'm interested in the relationships that are involved in these interventions, um, policies themselves, as well as outcomes and impacts. I'm here today to connect with potential collaborators and others with similar interests at FSU since I am new to this university. Um, it is an eventual goal of mine to send a proposal to NSF smart and connected communities. And so I'm interested in meeting folks who might be um, interested in doing the same with me. 
I have expertise in qualitative research, especially with uh, ethnographic methods and using them within organizations. Um, I have relationships to practitioner communities in digital inclusion and ICT for development. And I have a good deal of experience with um, technology and development policy in Latin America. So I'd say I'm looking for um, potential collaborators on interdisciplinary research about digital inequality in the US or abroad, um, or as it pertains to things like smart cities, and that I'm looking for collaborators with potential uh, complementary research methods like computational social science techniques. Um, I've just last month published some recent work about Google Fiber and anchor institutions in Austin, Texas, um, working on a discourse analysis of digital equity plans in large US cities. And um, I'm hopeful that in 2021, I'll start some new work on rural electric cooperatives and rural broadband. That's all I've got. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Vanessa Denon, and I'm a professor in Ed Psych and Learning Systems, more specifically in the Instructional Systems and Learning Technologies program. And I figured I'd start out by asking you all a nosy question or two. You know, what's the first thing you did when you got up this morning? Did you grab this and take a look, see what alerts came in for you overnight? Um, you went back to sleep. Yeah, that's what I wanted to do this morning. Um, did you post something online today? And if you posted online, did you take a moment first and think, hmm, does this really represent me the way that I want to represent myself to other people? And who exactly is seeing this when it goes online? These are the kinds of questions that I ask. I'm really interested in how everyday people are using the technology that's right on hand, um, social media in particular, but you know, where does social media end and everything else begin? It's hard to say, it all starts to blend once you're out there on the internet. Um, so I, I look at issues like identity, um, relationships and community, how we build our own social networks, and then how that supports our learning processes. And I define learning really broadly. So it's not just what happens when we go into our classrooms. In fact, sometimes I think that's the least interesting of it, to tell you the truth. But you know, what happens, you all have learned things online today that you didn't even think about as part of the learning that was happening. But in some way, these little bits of incidental information have crossed your path and will help you in some way today, whether it was a, an act of networking that you did or a little information tidbit that you found or a resource that you're interested in. So these are the, the types of things that um, I look at as a researcher. I am happy to help people who are looking to work with this kind of data and ask these kinds of questions who need some help with qualitative research skills. Um, I really well versed in qualitative stuff and I've done um, some pretty interesting work with some of my studies like going into things like video diaries and having participants build portfolios of authentic artifacts. I have worked with social network analysis as well and I'm, I'm well versed with all of the social media platforms and emerging tech stuff and I am an instructional designer by training as well so anything that has to do with designing and developing developing um, learning. I am interested in finding um, people to collaborate with in any manner of ways, whether it's a big thing or just a, a small bit, like having a few conversations about a mutually interesting topic. I work with Dr. Stacy Rutledge from Ed Leadership and Policy Studies, and we're studying social media and teens right now, which is really timely because it's their lifeline when they're stuck at home. And um, the rest of the stuff that I do fits in with all that I've described so far. So please reach out if you're interested in collaborating. I look forward to getting to know some of you better. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Pardon me. Hi, everyone. My name is Laura Hart. Uh, I am the UAS program coordinator at the Emergency Management and Homeland Security program. We are a department in the College of Social Sciences and Public Policy. Uh, I apologize. I only have a minute because I teach a class that starts at 530 p.m., but uh, I am an unmanned aircraft systems researcher. Uh, I have a lot of experience, especially with uh, therm thermal applications and thermography, specifically aerial thermography as it relates to field of view and missing persons investigations. Uh, I am part uh, in a principal member pilot of our uh, UAS team. 
Uh, we do deploy to disasters around uh, both the state and the country, depending on our tasking agency. Uh, but we do work to implement drones and disasters. Uh, so past disasters that we have deployed to uh, include disasters like Hurricane Michael, uh, the 2018 Kilauea volcanic eruption. Recent ones include uh, deploying during the COVID-19 pandemic to Hurricanes Sally and Laura. So uh, I apologize, I have to leave, but I have so enjoyed hearing everyone's research profiles and presentations, and I really, really appreciate this opportunity to co collaborate. Uh, so if you are interested in uh, collaborating in some way in terms of either UIS implementation and strategy in regards to a specific topic of your own interest, or uh, in identifying other portions of the public sector, pardon me, other portions of the public sector that may benefit from this technology, uh, it is a good uh, tool, but again, it is just a tool, not the uh, be all end all. So uh, with that, I'm going to leave and thank you again. Hi everyone, I'm Beth Hodges. I'm the Director of the Office of Research Development. I wanna thank everyone for participating today. And I'm very excited to see what research collaborations come out of this. Um, I wanna take just a minute of your time this afternoon to give a, a plug for the office and share with you some of the activities that we're involved with um, to aid researchers like yourself in case you're not familiar with our office. Um, we are engaged with pro proposal management for large multidisciplinary efforts. Um, we, can, we can work with you on those, so I hope you keep that in mind. We can assist with funding opportunity identification. Uh, we recently completed a funding module for people who may not be familiar with how to look for certain types of funding or um, maybe not familiar with resources at FSU for funding. Um, that will be posted to our website by the end of the week. We can assist with collaborator identification, both at FSU and across the state of Florida, in case you need to find a collaborator and there's just not the right fit, we can help with that. Um, we do a lot of professional development work, um, workshops, resources. Um, we have a database of successful proposals. If you haven't looked at that, that's uh, you can access that from our website. Um, we're regularly, regularly involved in proposal editing um, if you need another eye on your proposal for flow, for grammar, um, we're happy to assist in that effort. Um, the office oversees limited submissions. Um, so if you are applying to something that only allows so many people per institution, um, please visit our portal for that. Um, the CRC uh, management, um, Grace Atkinson is under ORD and she can help you with internal funding. And then we also are involved with early career grantsmanship. And if you haven't, uh, if you're a, a new faculty member, I encourage you to meet with Dr. Rachel Goff Albritton if you haven't already. Um, as research development professionals, ORD members are here to help you become more successful grant writers and be advocates for your research. I hope you won't hesitate to reach out whenever my office, any of us can be of service to you. Next, I'd like to pass this off to Dr. Michelle Kasmer. Michelle is a professor in the School of Information in the College of Communication and Information. She's working to develop a new initiative, um, Tech Innovation and Culture at FSU, and I'll turn it over to Michelle. Thank you. Hi, you all. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's really good to see you. You probably don't want to listen to me for very long today, and I don't have much to say, but I was excited to learn from you this afternoon, and as Beth kindly introduced, I am leading a university-wide effort to draw on, support, and further FSU's expertise in, basically, I'm calling it people and things, but you know, that wasn't a great name. So we had a task force, an interdisciplinary task force that decided that technology, innovation, and culture was likely to equally appease and anger um, the correct number of people. And so that's how we're going forward. It's going to be a wide open group um, with subgroups, hopefully oriented around research, curriculum and instruction, and scholarly engagement. 
I hope that you'll all be interested. It certainly encompasses everything that folks talked about today uh, and more. We would like to cast the biggest possible open net and really engage in a lot of conversation and collaboration and really open thinking about how to move ourselves forward in an increasingly technologized society. I will drop my email address into the text chat. If you have any questions, if you're interested, if you have comments for me, feel free to email me at any point and I look forward to uh, working with and hearing from all of you at some point. Thanks so much and have a great night. Well, thank you, Michelle, and, and thank you all of you uh, for coming out uh, this afternoon, this evening now. Um, I want to give special thanks to my automatic slide timer that I put on my own slide. Uh, to Beth Hodges, uh, Evangeline Kupek, Rachel Goff Albritton, and Grace Atkinson, all from the Office of Research Development for all their assistance throughout the development of this program. I uh, also want to give special thanks to Jonathan Nurse, FSU's Federal Relations Director, for coordinating with Dr. John Parker uh, from the National Science Foundation, Michelle Kasmer for giving us closing remarks, and Laurel Fulkerson for uh, all of her support of the Collaborative Collision Program. I also want to give a very special thanks to Dr. Gary Ostrainer for all of his support for Collaborative Collision over the past couple of years. As, as Gary steps down to faculty here uh, in December, I hope to see him at a future Collaborative Collision uh, looking for some potential collaborations. Uh, next spring, we have two Collaborative Collision events planned so far. First is Collaborative Collision Climate Solutions. Uh, this is going to be a, a, a bit of a different uh, different thing for us, we're going to open it up to not only FSU researchers, but also FAMU researchers uh, to try to broaden our, uh, our uh, network of potential collaborators, especially on climate solutions, as FAMU has a, a quite a strength in that area. Uh, we are also going to be celebrating the five-year anniversary of the Collaborative Collision Program in 2021. Uh, by revisiting the very first event that we ever held, Collaborative Collision Health. Uh, we are anticipating this to be a multi-day event actually since there are so many health researchers uh, and that will be sometime in early to mid-April of, uh, of next semester. So keep an eye out the first weeks uh, of spring for an announcement regarding registration and availability of those two different events. And again, uh, this presentation was recorded and will be posted to research.fsu.edu slash collaborative collision uh, and will be sent to all of the registrants uh, after this event. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. My email address is mike.mitchell at fsu.edu. And uh, all of us from ORD can be found at uh, ord.fsu.edu. And with that, thank you all. Uh, hope you have a pleasant evening and a happy holiday. Thank you.